All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started here in just a minute or so. I know we, we have a forum. We, we do have some board members that are traveling here. I, I want to make sure with our first item we're going to go to that we, we have a board here necessary, which is a full board of best of our abilities to make some decisions if we need to. But if you want to, if you want to write down the order that we're going to go in before we start here officially, if you want to just jot down some numbers, again, owing to a flexible agenda and owing to some guests that we have in public today to get them uh, their, their items heard in a timely manner for their business day. But the order we're going to go in today will be, I'll you know, start with item 18. So we'll go 18 first and then 28. Third item will be number 14. Fourth item, 29. So again, the first four, we're going to go 18, 28, 14, 29. I really we're kind of jumping around a little bit here. We'll give you all the page numbers and address what those items are when we get to them. Uh, next four items after that, we're going to go 26, 17, 23, and then 24. So the fourth, 18, 28, 14, 29, and 26, 17, 23, 24. And then we'll finally jump back into financial so number nine. There'll be nine items today. And then that should just about take us to the agenda. We'll wrap up the extra items that we didn't touch right now. Uh, let's see here. Staff, we'll go ahead and get, get ready to start. We're good to go. All right. Well, let's, uh, once you bring us back in session, President Sloan and TF, you would be ready for the roll call for us here in a second. All right. Thank you. Start off. All right. We're still waiting on a couple of members. They're just waiting late, but they'll be here in time now. So at this time, I would bring the meeting back to order. And TF, you would please take roll. Turn it over to Donnie Nelson, Shark Talk Survey. All right, thank you, President Sloan. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to day two, and we're going to have some fun right off the bat. As we always say here, right, we need to be student athlete centered. And this kind of leads into a mixed emotion between student athletes, finances, a lot of different factors going into something that's fairly new for our country. Shot clock in the sport of basketball. So, uh, cover page 190. Let me tell you what's in the packet first on page 191, and I'll, I'll go over these once we get there, but it's a general proposal. It's kind of a summary about what's happening around us uh, and in the country. Pages 192 through 194 is the NFHS rule. This is the second year now that the National Federation of State High School Association's Basketball Rules Committee has 
authorize the use for state adoption. It is not an actual full mandated rule, but it is a state adoption rule. I'll address that with you. And then on page 195 is, a, in essence, a general survey that was conducted during the basketball season last year for our coaches with the idea that maybe at this time this year, we would entertain the possibility of doing some kind of an allowance to, uh, for a basketball shot clock. So where we are, first of all, around the country uh, of our 11 section seven and eight states, nine of them, so us not included, Wyoming not included, are at least into year one of a trial basis. Some are into year two as a trial basis because they did start it last year as a trial. And then there is one state, our neighbors to the West that have been using a basketball shot clock as part of their rules, state adoption rules for many years. They never had, California and CIF never had an opportunity to have representation on the National Basketball Rules Committee as a voting state because they were out of compliance with the rule book. Yet they had to be in compliance with certain things in the rule book in order to have a voice and vote on things. Uh, but that now they're, even though know, they're using a 30 second shot clock instead of 35, which I'll address here a little bit, uh, they have been granted permission to serve as a voting. So, Thank you. Board members will, will note that you care. Thank you very much. We're just getting started. Perfect timing. We're on item number 18, starting page 190. This is basketball shot clock, right? Basketball shot clock. So, anyway, going to page 191. Um, Wyoming, from what I understand, has no interest in any way, shape, or form for entertaining a basketball shot clock. Again, I mentioned the other states that are that are at least in year one, and half of the See, I remember see four or five of the states that of the nine that also uh, are in this process are in year two. And I know that the states that are in year two, those four or five, they are looking, not guaranteed. I think actually, I think two of them are guaranteed to implement it fully. The other two are still um, analyzing it. The other, the other four or five off states that are in year one are kind of like what we're talking about here. They're going to take some time to use it as a as a trial period to see if it works for those states. But the, the trial period also incurs a significant cost. I know many people can speak to this. My understanding is a very general figure, very general figure to purchase equipment, to install it, and to actually get a shot clock up and running in the way that the Federation requires is probably about a $5,000 bill per school. And probably in just one gym. Maybe, maybe there's discounts for putting in auxiliary gym too, which, as we know, are probably our larger enrollment schools with two gyms and playing games in both gyms. It would be the potential. But uh, this, this is so let's go to page 191 here and, and looking forward to possible implementation on a trial basis for two years. I would never recommend that we ever uh, mandate it in advance that to have a trial period. Obviously, once you spend money, and purchase equipment, you have a trial period, more than likely we're headed towards right implementing shop clock. I can't imagine we'd have our, our school districts or schools spend money to purchase shop clocks and sell them and all the things that add up to a five thousand dollar bill in the gym and then say two years later, you know, we're not gonna use them. I, I wouldn't see that happening. So this is a very this is a very serious item, right? We talked about expenses for schools and member dues yesterday and a lot of other things that are coming up. Um I, I wish I could say that uh, you know we had a money tree out there, but I don't know, I guess we do have a couple of loan companies here commercials all the time about. We give you money and there's no interest charge, and you can pay it back whenever you want. So I'm, maybe maybe a sponsor out there somewhere for shot clock. But anyway, uh, so it's a recommendation is because I, I I'm bringing this forward because our, our basketball coaches are interested in this, right? Part of the reason is they don't want to be quote unquote left behind in, in a basketball shot clock. What's going on around us? And it's not just the section seven eight states. Obviously, the rest of the country is also on a large percentage getting into shot clocks. Uh, I never I never really thought we'd be here with the Midwestern states and the kind of basketball rooted history, but a lot of our Midwestern states are also moving in this direction. I'm not saying that the game is to the point where it's not healthy that we need a shot clock. On quite the contrary, I think the, the game of high school basketball in Nevada is really good. I think it's very healthy. I think our style of play is is exciting. Uh, so I'm not saying we need this because of the game and the way it's being played. I'm just saying we need to consider this because it's happening all around us. And should we be left behind or do we care? Wyoming doesn't care. Uh, that's, that was made very clear in our last section meeting here just uh, uh, a week ago. So here, here, here's, here's what, if there's any kind of adoption, varsity level games only, and that would be for the 23, 24, this upcoming winter season. And then to be revised possibly to also include an option 
for not varsity games in 24 25. That's bullet point number one on page 181. Also, as a, as a trial period, what other states have been around us, non league games first. Obviously, no postseason games for two years. Uh, the shot clock operator must be someone um, older than the age of 18 or older and must be a high school graduate. That's, that's something that wasn't required by the state. This falls what other states are doing. That they don't necessarily have to have a quote unquote paid official to do it because of financial considerations. Some states are. Some states are using actual paid officials and training people how to use the shot clock. Obviously, we've got the NNOA, we've got the SNOA, we've got the Indiana CSNO. So we, we've got groups here that if schools or districts, depending on where we go and tighten this up, want to go that direction, they could. We know what expenses are. Uh, it is a mandate that shot costs must be mounted off the playing floor. This is where the installation cost comes in. They, they can't be portable. That's for health and safety reasons that we're playing the game. So they got to be on the top of backboards. They can be on walls as of right now. Uh, but most of us, if we're going to implement shot clocks, certainly want to put them on top of the backboards. And uh, it doesn't mean that the lighting that goes within the backboard has to be tied to the shot clock. Uh, that's, again, an extra expense that, that happens. But most states are, I understand, using the lighting system within the backboard to, to fill you with the shot clock. And also the game clock as well. And then finally, that the reset, what other states are doing is, uh, you know, for a kickball or something like that, for the offensive team, it's back 20 seconds, not a full 35 again. And again, the, the rule, the NHS rule is 35 seconds. So go to pages 192 through 194. I'm not going to go over all this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of what I summarized on the first page. But you can see that the Federation has done a lot of work with actually putting together a rule for shot clocks. Jay, I'll turn it over to you for a second, just a minute here, if you want to address that before we get going any further. And finally, then for you, I have that, I that survey. It's on page 195. Again, a very simplistic survey conducted during the season last year. And it was, it was with our, it was done through the schools to represent each school. I think it was sent to the administrator's director, one vote per school. Please get the, you know, the message from your boys basketball coach and your girls basketball coach. Tell us what your school wants. And you can see the percentage. Basically, it was the same for boys and girls right around the, you know, and 80, 20, a little bit, little bit less on the girls' side, but that was 76, 20, 77, 23 percentage. Basically, 80, 20 on the boys' side. Uh, Jay, is there anything very briefly you want to recap on the NFHS rule that I missed? Anybody in this room, has anybody in this room ever run a shot clock? Okay, Mr. Jackson, what's involved in running a shot clock? Oh, Tim, if you want to make sure it's turned on, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can turn it off. Thank you. 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 Uh, our kind of solutions for um, Usually, they're the person with a handheld uh, player, for lack of better terms, that sits next to the clock operator, uh, with ball shot. Then you can jump, they reset on the dead ball, they reset it based on the clock, reset it to 20. Um, my concern would be not addressing CPFD, but that gentleman right there, please, for stopping. The statement that it has to be an 18 year old operating it uh, would be a very big concern, considering the fact that right now we have kids running the clock in the book, and a lot of gyms do staffing issues. Uh, they are compensated, they are hired by us in a way, however, they are not 18 in all cases. Um, the other concern I would have is the word mounted. Um, I wonder if there should be consideration given to the rolling type of shot clock to go out and sit in the corners on the floor. They're a cheaper option. They're also wireless. It would be a good suggestion that maybe we should look at that and adopt it so that it fits that role. Um, the other thing is it's September 28th. Basketball season starts in a month and a half. And we're talking about putting this in place for this season. I think we might be a little bit uh, late in this. Um, I, I know there are a few schools in the Valley who have shot clock operated. Uh, ready to go, and it was probably one of them. Uh, I know Durango has the shot clock, but they're the rolling type. Uh, I would be hard pressed to say that we uh, just interested in a way in that answer. I think I would be able to fit for that. Um, so I'd have a few concerns. I'm on the shot clock, I think it's more what we do. Uh, and I know Midwest boy, but I still believe the shot clock is the style of that well, right now. Um, other questions? No, um, thank you. So you're just holding a, a remote and, and clicking right there, and, and it's already programmed to reset at the 
proper time. Correct. Uh, but it, and not full in California. I actually see very talented clock operators that can operate full at the same time. That would they do save the cost, but I don't think that's something we want to do the first year out because I think it's going to be something new and it's going to become controversial if uh, they miss one and hit the other. Uh, I can already tell you about my head because we're still going to complain right now. So I, I would suggest perhaps that we get mixed up here to see if they can snap at this point. And it's not, if they can't, we need to make adjustments. I think we need to implement this. And if we push off another year, we're still going to be here to try to. Thanks, Jim. I'll leave it up to the board. Any questions from the board, comments, suggestions? Uh, Tammy? I, I agree with Jen 100%. I'm very much a proponent of it, but I'm looking at facility wise as an assistant principal over facilities and athletics. I don't know that I can get that happen that way. Like, as much as I would love to say it's possible, there's a lot of red tape that is involved, but with not only with that, but also like if things are available, you know, I'm hosting a tournament the very first week in December. So I just don't know if. It's logistically possible this fast. I'm not saying don't do it because I agree with you. I'm saying I'm very much a proponent of it. I just don't know that we can make it happen that fast. Uh, Tony from New Karen. I'm a huge component of this. Um, being involved in basketball the last four years, I, I want to look at Donnie and this group and say, can it happen? Can you feasibly do this this year? Because if it can't, I agree that we need to push it off and do it right. But can it happen? And, and are we gonna, you know, not do it up to par? Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Member Rainey. So again, this is there's a lot of ways we can go with this. And Member Paul, I'll get I'll get you a question in a second. This is an option to allow for it to happen this year. It doesn't mean it has to happen. It doesn't mean it has to happen even next year. If schools want to and have the ability to do it, and again, it's, uh, many schools won't have the ability to do it this year. It, it is not realistic to order a bunch of equipment on September 20, 29th, have it ready to go for the first permissive contest day towards the end of November for winter sports. It's not realistic. This is about do we allow for, for those schools that want to give it a try in a tournament locally, in a non-league game, because they just happen to have the equipment to be able to go to allow them to do that. Another option is that this post pulls a year and start a two year rolling pattern maybe next year. But again, I, so I, I want to make sure it's very clear that if, if we do allow the option to happen, it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean anybody has to. Will there be inherent pressures on schools to go, hey, yeah, he's allowing it to happen. Let's get some word right away. Yes, I, I, right, I'm not unrealistic to think that will happen. But again, just having the option to use it before we even get to make and they use it. We're not there yet. That, that's that's two years at least down the road, if not probably three years down the road, because I don't know that schools can get that equipment this fast or this year. But it doesn't mean we can't make it an option for three years, right? Extend what, what I've got ready here. Uh, Member Paulson, then we'll go back around. Go ahead. Oh, I think you, uh, uh, Wade Paulson, Region 3, for uh, I think you answered my question. This is completely voluntary uh, by school, it sounds like. Um, and so uh, it sounds like if we roll this out, uh, some, some teams could go into an environment where they're using the, the shot clock and then go to another environment where they are not. So uh, uh, that is a little concerning in, in the fact that now you're playing style of basketball where, uh, where you're using the shot clock and then the next game you're not using shot clock. Um, uh, I don't know. I think when you get into league play that we might have to say yay or nay kind of thing. Just you know what I'm saying? Just to keep everything um, equal. Uh, but I, I'm a proponent of it. I played basketball for a while two parts of my years and uh, the shot clock is the future. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. So, and again, you both kind of answered, and I don't want to restate all of it, but 
But I think if, if there's a frustration I have, whether it's committees and on this board, is you know, we put things up and then when we bring it up, it's too late to do it. And we keep kind of pushing timelines and never seem to get timelines right. So yeah, for me, I think looking at the coaches, looking at the way basketball is going, I think it's a it's a vote yes, and it's just a timeline issue that we talk about, not whether we push this forward or not. So I'd like to see, and again, whether you know, if you if our review was going to host the tournament and they had the decision whether this was going to be a shot clock tournament or not, sounds like a great thing. But again, lead play would need to be consistent until all schools were ready to do it. But I think, you know, what I don't want to see is that we, we push this up until we're ready. Bob? Oh, I'm sorry. Bob, a bit um, for basketball purposes for a more. Rollins, question for you. Do you anticipate any support from the district for the cost of uh, putting these shop clocks in our schools? Because as I'm thinking about our schools, I'm only aware of one school in the north that has a shot clock set up this time that you asked Demonte Branch of any other schools that have shot clocks. And, and I know I had the opportunity to see the numbers that the Pam shared with us when we talked about this back last March, I think, right here in this room. And, and it's a pretty significant expense. So do you anticipate that there's going to be any budget from the district to help support these out of the schools, or is this going to be on the schools when we go back and talk to them? If you want to do this, do it, but you got to buy it yourself. The, the reality is that the survey that was given was just basically very basic survey to the basketball girls and boys coaches, I believe. And the question was, do you would you like a shot? That's all the question was. It didn't say, would your basketball program be willing to pay for the installation? And putting all of that into your gym, that was not a question, which I think should have been a question because as a former basketball coach, I would love to have a shot clock if I didn't have to fundraise and put it in my gym or both gyms. So the, the reality with this here is, is that what does that one or two year implementation look like over the next couple of years? Let's say Washoe gets involved or the North gets involved and we have two out of our 11 schools with a shot clock. Is that a high enough percentage to give us the data to say, okay, we have one more year after next year to have a couple more schools that have a shot clock. And then that third year, all of the schools have to have a shot clock here, right? Whereas you're only going to get a small percentage of the teams in our area that are actually playing a game in a two year time period with a gym that has a shot clock in it. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, Ron. I, I just want to say, I think even though the survey was, was a simple question, we know that all of our schools are playing in tournaments and such over the hill in Sacramento area in California. And so they've all got experience playing with shot clocks because they go over there and all those tournaments are being played with shot clocks. So I think that their response was, oh, yeah, this is great. Perhaps when we say yes, I think they are truly speaking from, they think this is a positive thing for the but again, based on their experiences in playing in other states where the are shot clocks exist. All I was going to uh, say, there, all I was going to say was, we're not doing our kids any favors. The next level, everything's a shot clock. They go to college, it's a shot clock. So in order for us to get these kids prepared, if they do want to go on and play college, they got to battle a shot clock. So I'm 100% real. Um, uh, Colin McNaught, Region 4, just a couple of questions. One, um, just to clarify, because I'm new to this conversation, and the, uh, I think it's not as special for you. Um, this is coming from, because everyone else is doing it, we kind of want to do it too, right? I mean, am I understand that correct? It's not, there's no, there's smoke, but there's no fire. Like, there's no problem. Am I correct about that? Or Yeah, so again, I'm going to speak. I'm going to make everybody understand this is not certainly a personal NIA staff recommendation. It's bringing it forward to say, here's what's going on around us. Do we want to also engage or not? Wyoming is not. They're not taking any peer pressure to what's around them. Yeah, I'm not saying the game is unhealthy here. I just want everybody to understand what the environment is in the West. And also in the east and also in the Midwest part of the country. And that's why the NFHS gave the state the adoption. And I'll go back to your follow-up question in a second here. Uh, again, look and looking at these dates, 
you know, 23, 24, and look at number one on page 191. Doesn't mean it can't become 24, 25. We do this again here in the next meeting. This means 24, 25 can't become 25, 26. It was just to say we want to try and look at it right now. Again, being very realistic that we only have a couple of schools that would really truly be able to implement it this coming year, but it would be a start. So the, date, the dates are subject to amendments. Did you have a follow up? There's a couple more. Yeah. So um, like I said yesterday, lots of questions. Uh, the survey that was sent out, did we also ask principals, administrators, or was this just coaches? No, no, it went through the administrators and the athletic directors as well. And the survey said, please ask your coaches in your one vote, either administrator or you didn't go to the principals, they went to the administrators and athletic directors. Please respond. A very general survey. Are you interested in it? Which led us to, to this point. Okay. It didn't go as, as um, Vice President uh, Stawar said. It did not involve asking schools and principals, are you going to be able to fund this? Did not ask school districts, are you going to be able to fund this? It was very basic. Uh, President Sloan, do you anticipate this being a site based thing or do you think this is essential? Well, out of the comment that Superintendent uh, Russell said yesterday, that apparently schools have money to fund this. So I don't know. That'll be brought up in the superintendent's meeting when. So, okay. And, okay. And my, my only potential concern with the, like the being optional is just kind of like a, a fairness across the board. You know, some schools principals may choose to do it because they like are really invested. Let's do it. Other schools don't. How is that fair across the board? Um, I don't think the timeline is realistic though to say everyone has to do it now. And just a uh, member not from conversations with my colleagues around the West in particular, they encounter the same situation. Those that are in year two right now of an adoption, because yeah, last year was year one, states jumped on it. That exact conversation happened. And from their response was that in year one, only a small percentage actually engaged because they went after it right away. And whether they're, you know, again, school districts and other states are, are formulated a lot differently than what we are, right? We don't have Clark County school districts the size and magnitude in the funding mechanisms that exist in our state. Many other states have smaller communities that want to high schools and school district. And so some of those are important. Anyway, to answer your question, smaller percentages usually did it in year one. The percentage grew in year two. Some of those states told everybody, hey, we're going to do this in three years, whether you like it or not, be ready for it. So we're giving you two years to be ready for it. Other states are still in year two and they're not sure if they're going to go forward it because not every school has still engaged in it. It's been just a voluntary thing, non league. I mean, yeah, not the you know terms are okay, but definitely no league games, no no postseason play. Is it equitable? Debatable, right? Some schools will want to fund it, some schools won't. Okay, and so just so I'm clear, what exactly what is the possible action? Like just to say if you can do it. Well, I'm gonna go to Matt and then Matt and then I'm gonna make a comment on it. Okay. Um, I agree with Tony. We're setting our kids up to be a little bit behind the curve when they go to college. Um, I don't, I'm not in favor of this two year trial period. You want to start pissing people off, have a bike job off, and then go, eh. But if we're, we either need to be all in or all out. And I believe the timeline can happen. Um, I'm in favor of doing a 24 25, be ready to go. Drop dead date, everybody be ready to go. Not just hit and miss a school here and there. Everybody be ready to go. We, we need to be all in or all out. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to follow up with that. I absolutely agree. And Kevin made a comment, made a comment as well. And I, 23 24 is too quick, too fast. And Tim made that, that comment as well. There's a lot of logistics you have to get with your vendor, you have to ensure that they have a clock. You know, and again, I can. You guys know how I feel. I support this 100. percent You know, um, but I have to ensure that if we're going to have to put shot clocks in the front gym and the back gym, that's 78 units for CCSD. So again, I have to get with the vendor to make sure they have them. I have to get with the district to make sure that when they're installed, that they're installed in a timely manner. I think right now we, have, if we're in agreement that this this needs to be done. I think we as a board today should vote for it, approve it, and then go forward. 23, 24 has to go off the record book. Um, because 
There's a lot of other logistics. I have a problem with the rule that stays an 18 year old on the clock. I have a huge problem. It's a Pam Sloan problem. I'm going to just voice my opinion. If I'm having an SNOA official on the clock next to me, and that's a paid position, and then a scorekeeper, that's a paid position, but we're going to put an 18 year old, somebody 18 year old adult who could also be a kid on your campus. Um, and that's not a paid position, but that's a huge responsibility. We can't devalue that that responsibility of that individual. So personally, I think that needs to be part of the officials association, and it has to be a paid position because that then, then it brings accountability to that as well. Um, so again, I think we as a board, let's make the decision. Do we want it? Do we not want it? If we want it, let's go further with it. Uh, I do believe, Donnie, correct me if I'm wrong, that last year there was the option for tournaments. Did you, you gave that option? I can get back to you in one second. Maybe you want to continue that. But if we open it up and say, hey, listen, because I have to pull the school to say, hey, listen, we'll shut off CCSD. I don't even know. But what if I play at Tim Jackson High School? Tim has a shot clock. You were just 12 o'clock for me, my friend. Um, and I go there and I don't, I'm not you accustomed to playing a shark clock and, and you say, hey, I got shark clock, we play shark clock in this family. No, I don't want to play shark clock. You know, because my kids, so that's another factor that comes into play. John. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not just too late. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Slaughter. I was hoping you'd let the liaison speak at this. Uh, I just want to let the board aware that. Although CCSD and some of the larger school districts, we do have those issues um, on a smaller scale in the rural areas, or uh, shall I say the frontier, if you will. Uh, we don't pay, we, we have two officials every time, so we have volunteers that do our sport box and everything. And, and in our smaller communities, that's way from the test, we can find a shot clock operator, someone who knows basketball, a retired coach, and a parent or something. So that's not an issue. From our last meeting last spring or summer, from what I can't speak for, I guess Dallas Larson's in the room, but some of the liaisons we talked about going back to our leads and saying basically consensus was a shot clock is coming. And for some of the small districts, we have to budget for that. And so we needed that a year or so to, to kind of get everybody. I like um, board member Hyatt's comment about, you know, maybe this year is a wash, maybe people dabble it if they have to build a have not home. But I guess what I'm trying to say is a liaison, from our standpoint, it is a little different in the rural areas, but we are budgeting for it. But at the same time, I do like the idea of, okay, by 24, 25, this has to be done. You know, and, but let people explore. And I, I, where we're at, we play in Utah a lot over the summer, but I do have a shot clock. I work for any of the three, I believe, it's here free. And uh, I had a manager on my bench last year, just kind of on the of a 35 second shot clock. We average about 18 and a half seconds per possession. So it doesn't really, I mean, for those that are against it, they just don't, I mean, rarely have a violation or what else. Dan. This is on. Hey, good. Former basketball mom here for five years. Sean no longer plays three sports. Um, most of these kids have played the shot clock. Um, even if they don't have one in their high school, they play tournaments, they play summer, they train somewhere, they at least had some experience with it. I agree with um, Tony when he said we're not doing these kids any favors if they've never practiced or played with one. So I just want to know, I, I apologize for being late because I'm not going to um, Do we have the option right now where we can, or, or we, where we can allow schools that have them this year or, or uh, to, is that what we're looking at today, to allow them to use them if they have them and then next year make a requirement? Is that what we're looking at today? Yeah, uh, Don, also the staff, we, so last year, we allowed the Tarkanian Classic, which is a significant size tournament here, to implement a shot clock. In, uh, they didn't do it for every game, but they did it in venues that had shot clocks available. It was within the Federation rules. It was outside the scope of the NIA, but it was a very only tournament specific. That's a, that's a national type tournament. We did that last year. What we're talking about today is possibly allowing 
other, all of our members will do it if they want to, not just in a specific tournament, to use it in non-league games, their own tournament games, things of that nature. Uh, I, I, put, I built in a timeline to it. It doesn't mean that this timeline has to hold. It doesn't mean that we even have to offer trial period. It could be that we exit today and say, let's bring it back in the next board meeting and pick a date where you're just going to do it once and for all. But it's, it's all, what I say, it's all on the table. It's all on the table. That, that's why it's just being brought here. But I don't want to rush people into feeling like all of a sudden the panic's on. We have to go do it. But I want to people understand to allow the option, you know, maybe that's not a bad thing. I, I again, my, my job is to bring it in front of all of you today and say, here's what's going on around us. What do you want to do? And and right now what we're looking at, they all have to be mounted because I think Kevin, did people get systems before and they were like a thousand versus I think it's like five thousand it's mounted, it's only like a thousand dollars. Like it was a, it's a significant cost difference if we do the ones in the corner that Mr. Jackson mentioned versus Making them have to be mounted and attached to the system. Was there any feedback from you? Like, I did about that. I can just tell you right now. I I have a explanation in front of me as I always bring in the school uh, to these meetings. The shot clock itself is twenty five hundred dollars, but then you get the lights and you get the controllers, you get the carrying case and all that. It's about a um, five thousand dollar ticket for one unit. For the for the ones that he mentioned. That's now. Um, in yeah. reference to the ones that are on the floor, I don't have a cost on that one. I it's probably cheaper, but it might be a, depending upon the gym floor, might be a safety issue. Okay, but if you position them like you suggested, I mean, can we get that option? Do we, get, do we have to stick to this, or can we make it an option where it has to be mounted or not mounted? We could, yeah, we'll still like, just said we could do whatever. Okay, I just want to recommendation is that because to me that adds more equity. It takes pressure off because schools kind of know what their budgets are. As long as they have a shot clock, we all know 20 seconds. You know, I mean it's gonna time 20 seconds, whether it's mounted or whether it's the important. And that gives them the flexibility then in their budget to make it more equitable and fair to the schools that you don't have the bigger budgets or smaller budgets. We can do, we can, this can be modified. Okay. This was just from Donnie. Wait, did you have? Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion. Oh, hey, Donnie, can I make a couple of comments? All right, let's go. Before we do a vote, let's get Donnie has a comment and let's hear from this. Did you have a comment before you vote? Okay. <laughs> Alex, Alex, did you have a comment? Oh, yeah, I just have a comment from me. Absolutely. This is still on. Okay, good. So it sounds like we have a consensus throughout. I think there was only three items here that's really a concern to all of us, which is the option of mounting or not mounting, the 18 year, and then putting in an actual shot in our regulation. Whether it's 24, 25, or 25, 26, instead of talking about it as a hey, this practice, but rather the board as an entity saying by X date, you have the option of mounted or not mounted, um, remove the 18 year requirement uh, because every community is different. And, and I agree with um, the had to have not you know, comment that was made before, then also the age. We do have a lot of even 40 year old who mature individuals. I don't think that's an issue, but that's all I have. All right, thank you, Mayor Willie. Uh, Mr. Trotter, just one second. So on page 192, shot clock displays. This is where this is coming from. We know that we have many high school gyms that the depth behind the baseline to the back wall is not all that great, right? There, there's many requirements for gyms for the NFHS rule book for safety standards. And so that is why number two, shot clocks should be recessed. That means just back behind the top of the backboard so we can know a ball is still in play or not in play and mounted on the backboard supports because if you have a depth behind the baseline and you have a portable shot clock at what point is it still a safety hazard that somebody the game is continuing beyond the baseline we know kids even in the corner court run behind the baseline if you've got a portable that's still within think about sidelines extended down to the baseline to the back of the gym floor that's still in a playable area and even off the court so then if you move a shot clock even further into the corner beyond side Lines extended behind the baseline, you might not be able to see the shot clock 
pretty far back. So again, it doesn't mean it has to be that way. We, we can certainly do that, but I would be one to say, be very careful that we don't put ourselves in the position of somebody running into a shock while getting severely injured and going to school, school district. This wasn't the recommendation. Now, again, it is a recommendation only, not a, not a, a mandate for the shock clocks get uh, displayed. Then we get back, back to the years of, we can do whatever you want with the years to implement and not implement, depending on where we go. Okay. Vince, I need to wait patiently. Talk about the SNOA, what you can do, what you can't do, and staffing, all kinds of things. Okay. Thank you, Don. Uh, Vince Christasa, President of SNOA. Couple comments. Um, the majority of our football games this year, uh, for everybody that's been uh, going to football games, are students running a five the chance. We're understaffed. Everybody knows that uh, on the field, but especially the auxiliary. So we already do it in high school football. We got a lot of 14 and 18 year olds running the clock and doing the chain. So my recommendation is lower the age to 14. Our minimum age for us the way right now is 14 years old. Um, so yeah, because if not, we're going to have an issue trying to stop the games. Uh, second thing is the shot clock's probably, and I don't know, Mark, you can comment on that. You got the, the book, you got the end clock, you got the shot clock. Shot clock, in my opinion, because Mark, you've been doing shot clock for you know, eight years, probably the most difficult job on the table, right? If you don't reset the shot clock where you're supposed to be at, everybody really upset. So, and, uh, and to your comment, it needs to be somebody that's trained. And it needs to be a paid position. It's going to be hard for us to find somebody to run the shot clock, which I think is probably the most difficult of the old all three positions. <clears throat> not have formal training and not pay the individual to do this. So my recommendation is that whatever the auxiliary pay is for the sports timers, be the same as shot clock operator. Just everybody knows that sure it's $28 per, per, per uh, auxiliary position. Uh, comment about the portable shot clocks. And I've done games with both. The high school I've done college where they're mounted and they're on the baseline. I don't like the idea when they're affordable and they're on the baseline. To your point, you, you got officials, you got players that are close to the shot clock, and you got somebody running into a trip, whatever else. So, you know, obviously it's a cost factor to have the shot clock mounted, but it makes it more difficult when it's on the floor somewhere close to the playing surface, is my opinion, because it's too, too close. You got to have it close so everybody can see it. You got players, you got officials moving all over the court, and you got to work the shot clock being the way as well. So, like I said, those are my three comments. Or you got anything to say about shot clock? Uh, I'll, I'll address it when I give my one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is there any, any questions for me? Like I said, I've been officiating a long time with them games without the shot clock, with the shot clock, uh, with that's no way. Like I said, my recommendation is you guys approve the shot clock today for. For prior basin for everybody to use next year because at some point you guys will be back here next year doing the same thing, having the same discussion we're having right now. And I officiated a lot of states around the western states, we're all going to shot clock, excluding Wyoming. But we don't want the matter does not want to be the last state I use the shot clock. And for those teams that go to California, go to Utah playing tournaments, we'll use the shot clock anyway. So it's not using teams. So, anyways, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Before we take it to vote, just take into consideration of the, the huge dynamic expectations of schools and the officiating and, and schools that uh, I'm just going to throw this out there that maybe we need to take a look at maybe 24, 25, have it as optional, take it off the books this year, optional, but you know, and then 25, 26, maybe full varsity, and then the year after that, um, BJV, and then by 17, by 27, we to the board. So that's just my comments. I that for schools for budgetary reasons, that'll give them, you know, time to plan. How am I doing, Sean? That'll uh, give the schools time to plan. But yeah, we definitely need to go in this direction. All right, wait. Uh, wait. Wait, Polson Region Three. Um, I like to make a motion that uh, we approve the shot clock. Um, and move forward in the following manner um, that in 23 24, it is in a voluntary basis with no league play or post play. In year 24 25, a voluntary basis with no league play or post play. 
in year 2526, all games will be done with a shot clock, um, including league games and post play. So full implementation on 2526. Also, the age requirement of 18 be moved down to 14. Uh, payment is optional. And uh, the type of uh, clock, I think we leave flexible um, as to the cost factors in different schools, outlays and whatnot. And also for sub varsity that we come back um, and we can do that the following year, but we can work that out. So for clarification purposes on 25, 27, 20, 25, 26, when you said all, you're just talking varsity. Varsity, correct. Okay, thank you. And then 26, 27, DJB, or you want to bring it back? To or we can talk about it and see how we want to uh, implement that, but I'm pretty sure that we can do that. All will bring it back. Yeah. All for, for the sub, for, for sub varsity, bring back. Bring say, back. Okay, maybe we, won't, we might want to wait another year. I don't know. You know, let's see how, how the varsity goal goes for the next two, three weeks. Yeah, because by then, when it's rolled out, then yep. maybe the vendors we can have that communicate. Thank you. All you. right, we have a second. Yeah. Okay, we have a first and we have a second. Any further questions, discussions? Everybody understands what's on the table. Thank you very much. That was well said. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, the eyes have it. Thank you very much. If we can now go to item number 28 on page 229. All right, item number uh, 28 again is on 229. Um, this is a very sad day. SNOA Commissioner Biggs, JB. Thanks, Mark. Hey, uh, Mark has been around for as long as I have and longer. Um, and just been wonderful to work with. It's taught me a lot over the years on, on how to deal with uh, situations that uh, you know get a little heated and, and uh, emotional at times. So I appreciate everything you've done for me, Mark, over the years in, in dealing with uh, high school athletics. Uh, hey, it all comes to an end at some point for all of us, and, and Mark has decided that this soccer season has driven him to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to do this any longer today. Anyway, uh, Mark, come on up. Uh, we all know what the, the item is here, replacing you or or with one or ten people. And uh, I think it's more appropriate to say that, you know, it might take ten people to replace you. So anyway, love you dearly. And uh, go ahead and give us your one minute speech. I have a performance of the shot. But I want to thank the uh, the uh, thank the board. Uh, made a deal with uh, Doctor Hughes when he started uh, in 1990 or 91, and when he left, I was raised. Uh, and David told me it's like 15 years ago, or so I, I might have overstayed my. Uh, <laughs> But uh, thanks to, uh, to everybody here, uh, went before this board to get a job, and uh, I love it. And uh, I will make one note about that. Uh, I will, uh, for the SNOA, 
Um, you can see the, the paperwork in your, your binder. It's, it it kind of goes over what the commissioner duties are and, and where we are with replacing um, our commissioners uh, over the years. Uh, in the north, they operate on a different type um, format. And as far as our commissioners go, they go sport by sport. I know that the SNOA has been, you know, once they found out that Mark was leaving, they had been meeting. Uh, trying to figure out what they want to do as an association. This letter goes out to all the schools uh, asking for nominations for the uh, commissioner position. Uh, rarely uh, in, in my time has a school or a school district responded with a suggestion on a possible commissioner. This is the case here. I received no, no uh, contact from member schools saying, how about this person? Or I want to nominate this person. So obviously we need the commissioner to, to work closely with the officials association. And a lot of times it's the officials association that makes a recommendation. So uh, at this point, Vince, come on up and, and let us know uh, where we are with the SNOA, what they'd like to do. Um, I've told them already that I'm on board with uh, this office is on board with, you know, whatever you want to do as far as commissioners go, if you want to go sport by sport or one commissioner, or two or three, uh, season by season. Let us know what you want to do. We will, Donnie will, you know, interview anybody who's interested. And there have been people that have contacted our office out of the SNOA officials that uh, say, hey, I'd love to be the commissioner. I'd love to be the commissioner for this sport. I've kept those all handy. Um, and we need to find somebody quickly to get in place for the winter season. So Vince, Thanks for being here and uh, let us know how the SNOA is doing in this. Got it. Thank you, Jay. Uh, publicly, Mark, 32 years as commissioner. If anybody had a chance, Ray Brewer from the Las Vegas Sun, a couple days ago, put a great article out. If you haven't had a chance to read it, read it. And it was it was a great tribute for what you've been doing for 32 years as our commissioner. Uh, you know, you trust me, when we take part, it's not replaceable, it's not replaceable. Mark's an expert in 10 sports. Very difficult for what he's done for 32 years to decide postseason officials to deal with the number of ejections, the soccer ejections. And like I said, Mark, just thank you from SNOA away for everything you've done for everybody. I know obviously the schools feel the same way. Thank you. All right. So moving forward, um, our recommendation is going to be this. Like I just said, Mark is an expert in 10 sports. Mark's been doing this 32 years. To replace somebody to oversee 10 sports and have the knowledge that he has is going to be difficult. So, <clears throat> what we did is we, we, had, we had a meeting with our SNOA leadership with about 30 board members. The board members obviously are only individual sports. We asked their opinion on a couple different things. Do we want to stick with one commissioner like Mark's been for 32 years? Do we want to have a seasonal commissioner? One would Open see the fall sports. We'd have a new one for the winter. We'd have a new one for the spring. Or the other option is to do what the North does. Uh, and Ellen, the um, you know, the commissioner of volleyball, we go with 10 commissioners for uh, SNOA, which one would oversee sport. So the recommendation from our uh, leadership was to go with the last option I just said was to have a commissioner for each sport. Like I said, it's, it's hard to replace somebody with. As much knowledge that Mark has over the sport, but we feel like we can come up with 10 individuals with an SNOA that we feel are an expert in their sport as far as rules, as far as communicating in schools, and most importantly, having time to do the job like Mark's done for 32 years. Uh, so, what we plan on doing is, if the board here is okay with it, soliciting our membership in the next week or two for your interest, conducting interviews. Uh, submitted a list of candidates to your office, uh, Donnie and Jay. And obviously, you guys have a final decision on who's mission was going to be. But like I said, we feel like with the leadership in SNOA, we got a lot of longtime officials that know the sport inside and out that you know, will represent their sport, you know, like the board does currently. Helen, you want to have any comment since obviously the North 
has a vision of these four. Alan Townsend, an efficient liaison. Um, I guess my one of my big comments is, you know, traditionally we've had a, a single sport commissioner, you know, for each sport since I've been around. It's quite a long time ago as well. And uh, according, you know, a commissioner per sport really lets that person be, you know, focused and an expert in that sport. It doesn't have to worry about, you know, any other things. And I know when, when Mark came on quite a long time ago, um, less sports, you know, there were there wasn't uh, boys volleyball and like football and et cetera, et cetera. A lot less schools, things like that. And so he, you know, was able to transition and migrate as soon as new sports were added and things like that. But I, I really think um, having a commissioner per sport is is a, is a really good way to go. Thank you. Uh, any questions from anybody here on the board? Wait, Domingo, Domingo, excuse me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Domingo Rivera, Private School Liaison. Um, the question is if you do individual commissioners, does that remove them from our official school because they're busy and we are already shorthanded? And how would that affect um, uh, their daily availability if they're the better officials? How does that affect their, their daily availability if they have paperwork that to consider situations that are happening? Uh, other sites where they can be available. Correct. And, and, and that's a good question. I'm sure there's other people who's thinking the same thing. Mark, Mark, was, Mark Hollis admits it's been on the field. 20 years plus, probably. 15, 20 years plus. Right? The only thing I would say is not Correct. So, so what Mark said, make sure what you understood. You know, you can still officiate. Ellen, you still officiate volleyball, correct? But I know you know don't like that as a rule where you can not officiate folks who can play which should reach over the state. But your point, you know, I mean that would basically take the official off the court for those for the playing field for the regional state tournament. But now I understand if they're gonna be a commissioner, they're the liaison between the NIAA and the schools and SNOA. So that would be in the interview process is are you willing to step off the field or court, you know, especially for the postseason play. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. Yes, let's. Right. Let me just make a couple of comments here. Um, I won and not in support this. And I'm just going to tell you that because maybe we, I have Mark and I go all the way back from the time this kid played at Silverado. Known this gentleman forever. He's just fair, honest, calm. He does it's nothing in the future. Decision doesn't matter where he is in the world. He doesn't just travel the states. I've talked to him. He's in Morocco. You know, he's always available. And, and I don't want to lose that, that consistency. And I know this is different for us, but when you have other individuals, you're, you have other different mindsets. You know, Martin was always gracious enough to go to talk to principals, get them off the ledge. He would go and talk to the administrators, watch game film with coaches and administrators. Can't lose that. Um, um, I just, I'm really concerned with having to deal with so many other individuals and, and the accessibility of and if they're current officials and I know they can do it up, up north, but the accessibility is so important. Look what happened last week that we have to jump. And I know nine times out of ten events you're our first call and then we get more people. Um I am not in favor of this. I'm just gonna tell you that I'm concerned if you go in that direction. So I just wanted to bring that forth. Any questions? Do we have some other questions here? But again, that's not going to be my decision. That's your decision. Anybody for the board over here? Ellen, did you have something to say? Ellen Townsend, uh, officials liaison. Uh, we're just going to basically address the concern about staying on the field or in the court. You know, for that, it's most of the officials that are. Commission, most of the commissioners are still officials and they work meets, track meets, wrestling, they do that sort of thing. Uh, and again, they don't assign themselves to you know, do any postseason. Um, I'm interested, Mr. Rollins is back. You know, he deals with 
10 plus commissioners. What was his opinion on? Oh, yeah, they've uh, they've all worked through my office and, and communicated with me, so there's there's really no been no problems at all with with the commissioner first board. So uh, I think the biggest problem that we have is trying to get all ten of them, of them together at, at, at one time. It's been probably the biggest issue that we've always had, but during the seasons it, it, it works out good. All right, thanks for the staff. So again, this is a this is a special item. At this point, Mr. Sosik, what we'll do is uh, our office will accept the recommendations that come forward, and then decisions were made in our office. And that's what it's recommendations yes and away. Well, once we see those all clearly, we're going to give you permission to make recommendations how you want to, based on this process of thinking you're going to have 10 sport by sport commissioners. Once we receive those recommendations from you, that's about two weeks' time. We'll then communicate with uh, all the rest of the leadership, let you know the direction the NI office wants to go and evaluating those, and then who at that point will interview for positions, sport by sport, sports connected together, however that is. It, it gives Mr. Beesmeyer and I some time to digest this. That'll be the recommendation. So I think that's what we're going for. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate it. And this one, uh, I mean, obviously, this is a big change for what we've done. We've never had a commissioner to have been one or 1952, so that's not where we started. But we feel each sport we can come up with one individual that has the time, that has an expert on the rules, and can communicate. Because as we all know, if you guys read the article that Ray Brewer put out, hard works 24 7, no matter what time of day or night it is, handle the injections, watch the film, whatever he's got to do. So whoever these individuals can be have to have the same mentality, mentality and flexibility to help things. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Would you please come in? And we'll conclude after this comment. Mike Seifert, former member of the Red I want to respond to Coach Kingo's question on the Toronto Forum. We're looking at each individual sport of who is recently retired to see who can fall on the official to fill the spot on an individual sport. Will there be somebody that would be a, an active official? But more so, we need to work those that are not going to take away from the Thank you. That was more of a direct answer to what we were concerned about. We don't know all the names of all the individuals. We have a basketball person in mind, football person in mind, baseball, softball, all the above, all the individual sports. Could be a sport that's somebody's still active, but that's the direct goal. Thank you. Which sport will you be doing? Never mind. I've still got a couple years. All right. All right. We'll move past that. Just a again, uh, Mr. Ratner, you know, I, there, there's a book about you in publication. So I guess that means at some point you, you move on when, when a book's been written about you. So thank you. Uh, you know, the love and support and respect from everybody in here to, to think about all that you've accomplished in your life. And that you've given as much time in your life to also make the NIA your top priorities absolutely phenomenal. So we're gonna miss you beyond measure. It means you might get a lifetime pass at some time soon, too. So we'll find <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, that's my wife. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go to agenda item number 14 on page 146. Transfer rules discussion. And this item is a discussion. All right, Mr. Nelson. All right, thank you, Brother Son. Nice Cover page 146. Let me tell you what, uh, what's included here behind this item first, and then I'll give you a little precedent why we have this on here. So pages 147 and 148 include uh, what I would call a hodgepodge of language that's taken from neighboring associations uh, about a first entry rule. I'll, go, you know, I'll explain a little bit more in detail later. Page 149 refers to language about a one-time transfer. 
Pages 150 through 154 are results of a survey that we conducted following our state athletic directors conference last year. That was at, at uh, Cox with Thomas and Mac. And we talked about this in one of my executive directors report during that state conference that I would do survey. We did right after that. So those survey results on page 150 through 154. So here's why we're here. Uh, if you remember the legislative session, we, we had much discussion from both sides of the committee on education, Senate side, assembly side, about having possibly forced upon us a one-time transfer rule. Um, it was going to be something that uh, the NI was going to have to create, but it also was very specific and no, it's like it very generic in that the NI just had to have a one-time transfer rule and then we were going to go from there. We have talked about this before. Uh, what is around us to get in neighboring associations, which again, full disclosure, whatever neighboring associations do doesn't mean it's fit for Nevada high school athletics and activities. What's around us is that of the 11, again, we have 11 state associations in our section 7, 8 on the NFHS and Brawl. We are the only state that does not have some kind of a one time transfer rule. Okay, it's against right, it's against wrong. Sometimes a one -tran time transfer rule equates to having a first entry rule. That is very big. Our county's been making some changes to it, and it's not quite having a one time transfer rule, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, most states around us have something along the lines of not just a first entry rule, but at some point after you've established initial eligibility, whatever high school you go to, whatever your background is, you still get one time free move after that. We'll, we'll get into some of that language here in a little bit. Uh, with the context that Mr. Anderson alluded to yesterday, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have some key connections and some friends on both sides of the education committees of both houses. This is coming back as again in the legislative session. We can certainly wait to see what they mandate us to do. We can be ahead of that game if we want to and do it our way. Uh, or we can go sometime in between and see what maybe sent us, maybe not. I was surprised, Paul, I don't, my commentary, surprised that that didn't pass that bill. I, I, I really am. I, and I think it's because you must have some connections with friends that we just got lucky. We told them, hey, look, we, we've already been talking about this. Let us do it our way. And, and we've got some support when that happened. So, but I don't think that will, that will wait anymore. So here we go. Um, what you have, first of all, pages 147 and 148 are a bunch of language. That's what this is. This is not written in proposal form. I just took some things, what other states do. I took commentary out of their handbook, again, we, we are in Nevada administrative codes. Many of our states around us are not in the same mode of operation that we are going to go to the Council Bureau. You know, they do it the old way that we used to do it, you know, in Regulation 27 or 28 back in the day when our fiscal report could approve something that's automatic in effect for all you long past those days. So there, there's, there's a whole bunch of options here. It doesn't mean that you have to pick an option. This is for discussion only today. We can bring it back more focused if we want to. Again, this is just to get some guidance report of what you want our staff to look at involving legal counsel. So there's, there's a bunch of different things here. I'm not going to read through it all for you. We'll, we'll, we'll do that here just to highlight it. But you see these options. They can be merged together. They could be looked at independently. You can strike one, strike the other. And that's not, um, again, not something we have to decide on today. On page 149, then, is the proposal in addition to possibly a first entry rule or an initial eligibility determination or an open enrollment rule is also language then beyond that to be a transfer in addition to. So you've got a lot of different options you consider. Number one, would we allow anyone, wherever they live, whatever program they're in, from a homeschool, a magnet program, whatever, to establish, you can go to high school A, Free and clear, start day one. Doesn't mean school district have to provide transportation if it's not available in the 10 zone, not getting any of that kind of stuff. That, that's not, it's a lot of district issues that again, I don't want to throw on them, but so to be considered, first of all, a start where you want on day one, pick your school, that's where you establish initial eligibility, then you go. That is what happens right now in nine of the 11 state uh, associations within the section 7 8 group. That alone. Okay, we're, we're one of two that don't do that. Is you can pick whatever school you want to go day one. That's what you establish in this shell. You go. 
Then beyond that, like I mentioned in page 149, the majority of states beyond a first interview rule also, also allow for a one-time transfer beyond that. Some of those are, you get one free transfer and you get full RC eligibility. Some of those states are, you get one free transfer after, even after your enrollment, but you only get some of our sales. But there's some wiggle room in there too. The reason I bring up A and B and possibly A and B going together are because we know that there was uh, one legislature who very clearly made it to, into our staff and said, well, the NCA has a year by year transfer portal. Why don't you? Why don't you, if a student says before June 15th of every upcoming school year, I want to go here, why don't you let them do that? We don't want to go that far down the road. We don't want to go that far down the road. But there is a there is a possible middle ground that might be told to us. The next legislative session that you have to allow not just a school choice, but a transfer even in addition to after that. So that's why I'm bringing A and B together. Okay. All right. If we go to um, some survey results, and these were sent to uh, one vote per school, but sent to principals, administrators. And athletic directors because some schools or administrators or athletic directors are one the same. So this is very interesting results. That's it. You, you can read them for yourself. You know, the question number one there about a first time in ninth grade and should be RC eligible regardless. That's basically the first issue rule. And there was a you know a 78% fair to that. Uh students should be allowed a one-time transfer was full automatic eligibility one time during your career. Um that could be considered one the same as one, but a little bit different. And I think people considered it not being the same as number one, so it was not as highly uh, favored, which I'm a little surprised from that. Honestly, it's only 50 53 percent favor over there. And then you see some follow up questions on page 151 about disagreeing in option two. And then you see that the transition to, well, yes, the um, you know, the allowance of movement would happen if we disagreed in two, but that was related to a first entry rule. And then uh, number three, a first entry rule exists, a subsequent transfer should be subject to. Current transfer rules, no changes to that administrative code, and there was a favor to that. So, again, okay, that almost goes a little bit against what I think is going to be told to us by the legislature next time around. So, we may be a little bit at odds with our legislature about that. Uh, roster exception that's question number four. Again, just making sure we see that if a student, this is almost to make it very clean, the student doesn't turn roster. They're still not held any other penalties. They can just go play another sport period. A lot, a lot of favorites just for that. Um, question five was about if we do keep it involved with transfer rules, about 180 school days of ineligibility penalty. Um, I was getting a little surprised by this statement. It, this some of these results didn't follow the survey that I conducted about two years ago. Some some of the some of the percentages actually changed in that. Uh, transfer being reduced. Lessened, and, and that was one of the questions I put out because there are states around us that, in a transfer situation, so basically in a transfer situation, that the student only needs to sit out half of a season. Uh, that's in neighboring states right around us. So you get a first entry rule, the states that are in favor of also allowing a one time transfer, a couple of them have actually gone as far as to say, Yes, we will let you um, not just have. So far, see, but we'll let you have varsity eligibility if you have to set out half the season of a particular sports season. That would that's that's a little bit of a different concept for me to digest, but that was that was that's why I asked that question. And uh, question seven about sitting out 12 months, just kind of a recap to verify question five. And so let's see, question number eight if the NIA were to have a first entry rule and also a one time transfer rule, the hard pick process should be eliminated from the regulations. Noting that obviously a change in zone of residency would still, you know, allow for a transfer to happen. So to me, eight was the key question. If we have both, would we say you you, you had your first entry rule and then you still got your as legislators may may come back as you also get your one-time transfer, but then from then on, there is no hardship appeal. You know you also take advantage of a one-time transfer after first entry, then in the second transfer, you are you are just out. Period of days, you know what the rule is, you got your freebie and your freebie. And so that was a that was a high as a favorite system I thought might happen, but you can see it was 64%. Okay, that's a whole lot. I know it's probably some foreign language to a lot of you in here about what the, the rules and regulations are. We're not the NCAA, but this is something we really need to look at as a discussion item today, knowing where you might correctly go for here. And I'd also like to remind you that we don't go into legislation until a year and a half. So we have time with this. 
So look, we have a little bit of time to put this together. Um, questions, comments, schools, liaisons. Um, Kate, I'm gonna bring you up to the podium. I'd like to hear, uh, Kate works in my office. She strictly does nothing but eligibility. Uh, she has, I, well, no, no, I said strictly. Uh, and everything else I don't want to do. I'm just kidding. No, she does a multitude of things, uh, but her main responsibility is, is eligibility. But again, remember, this is a this is a lot. This this is a lot. And we don't want to water it down to the point that it just makes it easy because Kate can talk a little bit of what she's encountered. And uh, why don't you start off? Letting everybody know how many transcripts you've already dealt with this year. Can you introduce yourself to Rebecca? Kate Sigari, BCNC Athletics for the record. Um, I've got 1,800 transcripts so far last year. So, uh, I mean, I, I was going to go through and kind of just pick apart some of this language to, to be the, the devil's advocate in some cases. But um, I kind of start first on to just talk about a survey and making sure that. Um, before we really move forward with anything, I think it might be beneficial to have conversations uh, with our athletic administration, athletic directors around each question. I think we're like three degrees, we're doing some of those things. So that I think there was a lot of confusion in what was being asked and how they're answering. And I think that's kind of apparent if you look at some of the questions and then in the responses, the percentages are totally skewed and some of the questions are very similar and just worded differently. So I just kind of wanted to point that piece out um because and in my side for people in public school and ccsd i think the most uh most of them what i'm hearing is they want access to charter private transfers and within public public transfers so for instance i only have a student under the magnet program and they need that magnet program to go to their school they want the opportunity for them to use the varsity eligibility scores that they did last spring um similar to how some of the public transfers are treated um, our school. Same with like a zone variance. Um, if a student is on the variance and needs a zone variance, then when they go private to the public, can they have similar um, opportunities for those students to have sub varsity in certain sports or even eligible university of Boston? And as our regulation state now, if you need a zone variance, you're in all 180 days or purposes to participate in anything. So I think that's part of what, from my experience with working in school of what they've asked for. And I don't know if that's necessarily how they answer these questions in the survey, if they weren't understanding what they were asking for. Um, so kind of speaking on their behalf in some sense, I thought I'll check it out at all at some point of how her conversations with that as well about transfer stuff. Um, the other thing I know, uh, especially for our small schools in our district, is the, the first time we process students that, um, so our young parents students that are only so varsity and they don't have um, JV options. So I know that they are a big proponent of wanting to have full eligibility to that first time entry goal. They've been with us um, you know, through the elementary and middle school. They're, they're saying, why can't they have that full eligibility um, as a freshman? And, and so this, if you look at entry goal, would allow that. So I know that they would need some of that. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things that I'm concerned with is the language gets written and to ensure that students that are on temporary guardianship, students that are on shared housing, those still will fall under the NAC that we currently have. Because what I don't want to happen is our students that are transferring from their own school, and now they're in shared housing, and they're like, well, that's my one-time transfer. I should be eligible. Why am I not eligible? Because they're in shared housing. So I just want to make sure that language is very clear. Um, if we go in this direction, that other regulations are still in place, and it doesn't mean we just get a free prom. Um, another thing with just the wording is when it says you can go to any school and be eligible, I think in our district that would be a heart attack because then it's like, oh, I can go wherever I want. I don't live in that zone, but I'm just going to go enroll there and then use this person's address or whatever address I want, and I can just enroll there. There's rules and regulations about districts that are going to supersede being able to just go when you want, and, and I want to make sure that that's a true as well because those are going to be those conversations where a parent is now. Arguing with us, well, you know, the regulations say it's my kid can play anywhere and it doesn't say that I have to enroll legitimately there. So I think like legitimate enrollment at school is super important in the way that we look at these things because 
Um, I can tell you right now, we're going to have an influx already if this all passes with false documentation, increased um, people in temporary guardianships and charge housing that are going to try to go to whatever school that they want because, um, you know, schools that have programs like magnets and those that you don't know where those are just getting full eligibility. And those programs that are reviewed or uh, schools that are reviewed and Liberty and Bernardo that don't have any way to bring any students in are going to find ways to bring students in and see an increase in that with this. So. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Um, Lori, do you have anything to add? Would you like to call on this? Uh, I agree with everything you said. I agree with everything Kate said. Um, we're already seeing a lot of the false documentation coming in. Um, a lot of the parents trying to get eligibility at other schools, and it'll just go tenfold um, if it goes through just like that. So there should be some clarity and restrictions on what that one time transfer really means. Being somebody that used to do eligibility, because I was kind enough to give it to Mr. Jackson and the AK one, um, it is taxing, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You heard and you've heard comments about how you know you're working on it and the kids have to go bottom of the queue. It's not fair, you know. The school's got to make sure you do it. You submit all the paperwork, review, and oh, it is tough. You guys, it's extremely tough, especially in the fall. Winter doesn't it, it eases up a little bit. Spring, spring is tough as well. But maybe consider right now. Also, like wow, uh, maybe we need to. My recommendation would would since we have a little bit of time for the committee, definitely have the liaisons. Definitely have district leadership throughout the entire state go you know, to Zoom calls, hash this out, discuss it. I mean, have a discussion about it because this is there's a lot of nuts and bolts in regards to this. Okay, Tim. Uh, Tammy, you're doing for you by the Southern Liaison. Um, I I agree with Kate on a lot of things. I look at some of this and I get very overwhelmed. Um, I know Tony and I had this conversation because I was on the policies and procedures committee, and I agree. I think some of the wording in the questions people didn't quite understand. I don't think they answered how they thought they were wanting to answer. Um, because I, I know I had a conversation with another AP and, and they felt one way, but they answered a different way because they didn't understand the question. Um, so I think maybe having a deeper explanation on what those questions meant. Um, the hard, getting rid of the hardship totally sounds amazing because then it's, oh, I don't have to deal with all of this. But then I think about schools like mine where you say, okay, you know, you can establish wherever you want. Say it's a kid who does go to one of my bigger schools. They get a one time transfer. Our kids live in hardships 24 7. And the fact that, you know, this kid's parent just went to jail and they're living with grandma or a friend, that's not that kid's fault. You know, and to say that, you know, but I know my school is just one of a ton in his district, that we deal with things like that way more often than we want to have to. But the fact that we say, okay, sorry, you used your one time transfer. And then the poor kid has zero control of what's going on for him. Sorry, you can't play. Like that, that scared me. Um, also, like she was talking about the COSAs and the open seats. You know, last year my school had 200 open seats. Next year, we don't have a single open seat. And we are one of those schools that doesn't have a magnet, doesn't have all of those. So it just opens up so many different ways. And I think sometimes we create these rules to stop people from cheating, but then they just find a different way to cheat. And we hurt the kids that just want to play. So I think being, I, I am very much a proponent of the established where you want to follow. Following CCS rules, obviously, but um, I agree with Pam. I think we need to get input from everyone and just kind of move that direction and not make any decisions anytime soon. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you, Tim. Jason, let's go Jason and then we'll go Rosa. Jason, I'm going to grab three days on uh, Just clarification, this would not uh, be affected by those students whose parents legitimately, legitimately need to a different life, correct? Okay. Yeah, residency for sure. Right. I also said residency for sure. We're not, and I tried to make that in that question that that would not not change. Move into a two a whole new ten zone. That's that's separate apart from all this. Also, fashion for the record. So Don Donny has approached the super group now two or three times and uh, talking about the transfer piece. And I think sometimes maybe that surprises people would be. We do discuss athletics during our mass meetings, so we do have that kind. Of um, but and Donnie, you feel free to correct me, but I think I'm safe in saying that two two times in particular, you walked away from that meeting. I think very surprised by by the response, especially the first time. And he walked out with um, a direct feeling that our superintendent group as a whole really supported the first day three open enrollment concept. Um, and with the one time transfer, and along the lines of not doing away with the hardship after that, understanding kids that, that have a unique situation. But then it, you get basically your, your entry, your one, one freebie, and then af after that, you have to play by whatever rules and stipulations like through their, their way. Um, with that, our two large districts. Um, they have unique circumstances that most of us others don't have to. You know, and I, I use the example that I don't really have a choice when the kid shows up on my doorstep. The closest town that they had was 70 miles or 55 miles away, and they moved in. Um, it, it's different. And in those conversations, we brought back for the second time, the guy came back, our conversation really led that. All of the things that you mentioned, and you mentioned about attendance and, and that's a little name tag in front of you, but um, Kate, uh, all those things about attendance and what goes on at the district level well, absolutely has to supersede. Um, your you two large districts, you're still going to have your enrollment processes that you don't, and we don't as a board of control because you work for somebody else. And, you have those protocols. And so if you can't transport kids from one attendance zone to another, that would have to be something that's explained. You know, you may have a right to enroll outside of your attendance zone, but you're gonna have to find a way to get there. Um, those type of things. Maybe you have a district that you have very specific guidelines that you don't allow those variances in attendance um, uh, from zone to zone, or you only allow full mid. To, to occur because of whatever application process where you have it, a watch we used to have that and kind of do it away with that uh, in the last little bit. But I guess at the end of it, just from a global perspective, there's, there is support within the superintendent group to see this uh, happen. We, we really feel like our participation numbers and some of our sports and uh, levels has, has suffered. And some of that is how do we get more kids eligible quicker? Um, and, and there's always going to be a concern, as you, you mentioned, Terry, around we put regs in place to try and keep the few uh, that are perceived um, at certain many whatever rules that we can to create certain advantages. Um, but at the end of the day, the vast majority of it is about how we get kids physical attention, critical activities. And so, not to prolong it, just from our level. Uh, you're not going to get pushed back around the concept of uh, first entry, uh, first, you know, uh, transfer, uh, as long as after that, there's still an option to jump to some of those students. And it does 100%. Uh, it's, we must get ahead of this before legislation dictates it. We worked very hard to squat it this last time. Uh, from whether it was the school board association, superintendent group, the members of this group that reached out, but we don't want that dictated to us. So we really do need to get something in place. So thank you. Wade? Yeah, Wade Wilson, Region 3. Um, I just have a question, and I don't know. Um, 
maybe somebody could um, explain. If you look at question number five, the current 180 school days of ineligibility as a penalty for a denied transfer yeah. that we've made in place, um, is that like when somebody applies for a transfer and then they're denied, they have to wait 180 days, which is basically a school year to be eligible? Is that how that? For the transfer and go receive eligibility, they're ineligible for one school. For one school year. One hundred. Okay, because so they've already transferred and then they're ineligible okay. for that one year. And that seems to have a majority support right there from whoever took the survey, right? Um and so if with what's being said, I know from the discussions that we had and some of the complaints we had was the 180 days that they had to sit out. Um if that was cut to 90. What would that look like? If it was cut in half, is it you kind of allow a kid to come in, transfer, he was denied eligibility, but then you wait for six months. So it's not a complete school year, so you can't. I'm just asking the question what, what does that look like? I don't know. Uh, thank you, Member Paulson. So a little surprising to me that a, a two neighboring states have half a season penalty. And I, I don't quite know the, the basis behind that, but it, right, you, you've got a student who's going to get eligibility after transfer in that sport they just played, but they don't get it until they're, I guess, it's like half a season basically into league play. So you mean you're, you're, you're affecting the the well, I, I don't agree with that. They're affecting the local team to which the student transferred. You got, hey, all right, you, you may be our starting quarterback right now, but you're not going to be a starting quarterback in six weeks, five weeks. That's, that's just all. But that's the help of those schools that we lost this kid, so we don't want to see them until they play or not. I, I don't get it. So to answer your question about 90 days, I have no, I have no idea that would like oh, yeah. okay, Just so I think we would have to go if, if, we, if we eliminated 180 days to change that somehow, we have to go to more of a uh, like Don was saying, half a half, half the season or whatever, because otherwise you can take a kid who transfers at the beginning of the school year who's a spring sport athlete and he's on that, he or she's on that for the eligible. And at the semester, they become eligible. Um, then that wouldn't be fair to the student transfers and the sports for the fall sport. That would have to sit out 90 days to the full season. So uh, I think we have to look at that point. And it does the step, uh, Mr. Peck. I, I want to thank you for you know your your comments and kind of hit, not to say hit within those comments are that no no matter what we may or may not end up doing, it doesn't mean that a school district couldn't be more restrictive than what we come up with. Now, for, first and foremost, as you know, the title position I have association, I do not ever want to try and put. Clark County or Washington County into positions for their parents to go, hey, wait a minute, the rest of the states do this. Why don't why aren't you doing that? Right. And that's to be offered, but it doesn't mean that the association couldn't do that and that our two largest school districts on their own accord couldn't say, I'm sorry, but these are our district rules and they are more restrictive. Take it or leave it. Right. I mean, again, I'm just we we you know, wrong and I have had that discussion. Just sits there. Okay. Okay, I, I just want to make just a couple of comments. I think everything that everyone's saying is good. I, I do believe that what we ought to do is get a committee together as soon as we can and start discussing like this and looking at it. I think everybody needs to understand how we got to where we are. Um, I forget when the year was that we came in with the sub varsity rule, but that uh, that was quite some time ago. And the reason we came up with that rule and, and what that rule did is it's based Basically, if a kid transfers, you know, they, they typically are in time to sub varsity eligibility uh, for their first year of, of transfer. That was done so that we could satisfy 90% or so of, of the transfer requests that we were getting every year. All of a sudden, though, that became uh, an issue with a lot of people uh, because we have schools that don't have sub varsity support. So, in uh, the country club sports, tennis, golf, uh, those sorts of things, 
all of a sudden it looks well that's not fair to me because there is no sub there's not a sub budget so I guess what I'm saying is you know we we've, we've constantly been we've, we've been pushing the the uh the eligibility rules for some time. I don't disagree with, with having a one time transfer rule, first entry rule, or whatever. I don't know that that's going to change the number of appeals that we ultimately have. Uh, I think it's just going to push you back to the age group that we're dealing with. Um, you know, it'll be juniors and seven seniors. I worry about a couple of things with respect to allowing uh, more than one free uh, transfer or, or whatever, but you know, you have. First entry, I, I would suggest that it end there, um, or or you don't have a first entry, but you allow a one time transfer. Uh, the problem with with allowing more than one, uh, I think we've got even coaches. Um, I think we're seeing that already, where where coaches kids have arguments with coaches, and now they want to go. And I I can tell you over the years, as many level two appeals as I've done, I've never seen a level two appeal. Where it had anything to do with athletics. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. They always they come up with the uh, grandma's dying in, in Kenya. Um, you know, so now we got to make the choice as to where we're going. And, and I mean, that's an example that came out here. Um, it's always about athletics. Um, it, it really is. And, and that's what we get down to, you know, with respect to these things. Maybe not always, but, but I'd say probably 99% of the time. So, I think we got to be careful how we craft it. I think you got to look at a lot of things, make sure we're not killing our coaches, um, you know, and you know, or, or anything else because that's become a tougher and tougher uh, thing for these people to do, um, you know, as far as being good coaches and things they can't win. Tony Green. Tony Green, yeah. Um, I agree with, with what Paul said, but the committee, I think, should have those people on. She should be on absolutely because she lives it, she eats it, she breathes it, she does it every day, whether it's Washington County or whoever else who does it in Mom's office, whoever needs to be in it, because we're not experts. And at the end of the day, we're, we're looking for a 70% approval rating on this, which you're not going to get on no matter what decisions made, but I would make sure that. There. Okay, we'll definitely be here. Matt, go ahead. Well, I just want to uh, bring up one one concern I have about a lot of this um, for the smaller schools like uh, Winnemucca, Churchill County. You know, when you talk about uh, a freshman who can go in and play uh, for any school they want, well, you know what we we don't have people to draw from. So when you're talking about some three schools in the Vegas area, they're going to be able to draw a lot more athletes into their schools. And where is that competitive balance going to lead to? Um, you look at Elko Spring Creek, no problem, or Elko or Spring Creek to build a pretty dang good football, basketball team. They start adding those schools together and recruit kids that are Kids in eighth grade heading over as freshmen, over to Elk, over over to Spring Creek. What does that look like for us schools that are out by ourselves? We're just standalone. You know, there's going to be some fairness problems there. That's a really good point. I'm going to open it up, Dallas, Tim, Kate. Do you guys have any comments? And then we'll close this up after these points. Thank you. Yeah, that was hard to that was great month, but I, I will agree that on, when I was filling out the survey, I would look, I, I would look confused on exactly what the language was. It would have been a little bit nice to have a little bit more clarification on how I saw the type of principal and that type of administrator answers a book question. So, but yeah, the, the survey for me was a little bit confusing. Anybody else? In Jackson, Clark County. Um, I think another thing we really got to start to do is this for What what does this word mean? Because we're saying there are occasional times we have been diametrically opposed to things in our office for 10 years. Her and I have had epic fights in meetings because open enrollment for school of entry, 
zone variants all mean different things in different regions. We need a set vocabulary that we're all using and referencing to mean the same thing. The other thing is this. I think one of the things we need to point out is, or the question I would have is this. If we move to this new regulation, are we eliminating all of the other regulations for transfer and rewriting the entire section? Or are we adding this in and hobbling it together? Because I can tell you, the running joke for years in the 90s was, was this one time at the range. We have a regulation because this one time at the range. So we were there. I get it. So I think that's the other thing. It needs to be an overhaul. If we're going to do this, we can overhaul the entire section and not add another regulation. Okay, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Donnie Nelson and Mr. Nelson. I'd like for you to give me the recommendation or the board your recommendation going forward. Again, thank you, Mr. Jackson, too. Right. So that, that's what made us fan D2 is a, is an overhaul of transfers. Let's do that. Uh, we need to form a committee. There, you know, I certainly know that a few of us around the table probably have an idea of who should be involved in that committee. I can begin to tell you what the number. Uh, on an initial exploration committee would be, uh, I think between the various leaders that deal with us on a daily basis, we come up with some names, including probably some of us uh, ourselves, and we'll, we'll start there. Um, there yeah, that's, that's there. You go. Um, Paul, it's there. Paul, I, I don't know that. Just just to be clear, though, I. I don't know that the board needs to be approving of this committee. It doesn't is we're not gonna have a majority of board members. I think right we have the inherent staff ability to just get a group together to talk. I'll leave it as simple as that, correct? Right. Like, I'm like Mike, um, I think we should have something pretty solid to bring back, say by the spring meeting, so that we can start meeting with legislators, you know, right after that. We can back them to it and get to that. So, uh, but to answer Donnie's question, yeah, you as the executive director, you can form a committee whenever you want. This was a discussion item, but I need to get to the global. Yeah, and I just simply asking that there's representation of every league, every league, district, leadership, Clark, Washoe, throughout the state. So, I think that's key. Thank you. All right, we're going to close that up. Let's go to item number 29. Uh, that is on page 238. Okay, on CIT, Title One status. Uh, let's turn this over to Lord. Okay, so we have an issue that's coming to light when it comes to CIT Title I student athletes. And for those of you that don't know, it is children in Chinese who are homeless student athletes. And uh, I will say I absolutely agree with the law that says homeless students should have eligibility, we should be giving them all those opportunities. I completely agree. But as we had that previous discussion, we're having a lot of abuse of this regulation or law. Um, I have a student athlete that whose home is in Rural Nevada. Her family would move to Reno to get um, live with grandpa. And they kept their home in rural Nevada and older brothers living there, but the school classified her as homeless. Um, so it, it's coming to that. We're getting into stories. The school districts, their departments are I'm probably overwhelmed with the amount of requests that are coming in for that. And there's probably how many have you seen? We've seen so many. Yeah, we've seen probably a dozen that we know of that are probably not legit homeless, but we have to give them eligibility, and we don't want to see this 
this law change, but we need to do something to curb the abuse because the knowledge is out there. Just claim your this and you can get full eligibility. Yeah, I, I just want to make a couple of comments. So, um, again, always being involved in these uh, eligibility issues, um, Lori and, and Kate have brought this uh, to me. Rollins and I have discussed some cases that have uh, happened in Washington County also. Um, so, this is the McKinney, McKinney Info Act. This came into being uh, back when it was, uh, what was the first thing? That took out New Orleans and, uh, and, and all the kids uh, in New Orleans spread throughout the country. That's when that act came into play uh, because these, these uh, students from that area were showing up all over the place. And, and so they, they were being granted automatic eligibility. It is now being abused, I think, um, to a certain extent uh, in certain situations. And the question becomes is that law absolute, meaning if uh, if your whatever office within your district is saying, hey, yeah, this is a McKinney Pinto kind of one uh, student, um, do we have to grant them automatic eligibility? My thought has always been, yeah, initially maybe that's the presumption, but if there's facts there uh, that show that this is being misused and abused, uh, such as the facts that, that Lori uh, put out there, where it's clear that the student is not homeless, um, then I think we need to. Uh, you know, the challenge is that she's going to tell us make them prove that uh, they can qualify. By law, we're okay to do that. Because I know when I was doing eligibility a while back, that we had a student that got upset down with mom and dad on the second town. Ended up going to another school. They enrolled him as homeless. He was living with his club coach. And then the school enrolled him. It's kind of I made him ineligible. A lot back to my So, Kate, can you step up and I'm sure you have something to say in regards to this? And again, she does more in my office than just those building. <laughs> um, so, just to kind of piggyback on what Laura was saying, I, I think there's a couple issues with it. One, when we do have the evidence to say that there's something going on you know, in our district, at least we have some opportunities to investigate that and we have a Title I department that can do so. Um, what I will say is working with them, they're, they're very careful about the questions that they ask and how deep they go into an investigation. So uh, I don't know necessarily that even if some of those cases are being investigated to the length that they should be, if it is a false claim. Um, I can just tell you from experience, I had one where I, you know, believe there was something going on. And when I spoke with that office, they said, yeah, I talked to mom, that's the case. So that was the extent of the investigation speaking to the parent. Um, so that's just kind of where I'm at with how we are able to go. Because I think that because of that law, it is difficult to ask the questions. And if you can't ask the questions, it's hard to figure out what the truth is. So in my office, I'm very hands on when it comes to Title I. I have to work with that department and they do those investigations. Like I said, I don't know that it's necessarily being investigated um, in a way that it should. Uh, and I can tell you for the ones that I knew for sure were not real and that were able to um, you know, take away that middle status, it was very blatant. And um, I think it's pretty easy for them to just claim Title I is just in their registration process. So unless somebody questions it, they can pretty much commit a lot of without any evidence. Um, the other thing that I'm hearing in my health board and ethics services is now that they know that, um, I, I do have a couple of schools that have kind of figured out that if a student is starting to have some issues with their eligibility due to their circumstance, uh, all of a sudden they turn around and two weeks later, they're now like a one. And so they're figuring that out through somewhere that that is the whole that if they're hitting some walls with their eligibility, if they're able to just claim Title I, then we can ask questions and they're eligible. So it's definitely becoming more of a concern uh, as of late. Um, I just don't know how I really do We don't want to take it away, obviously, for that. Thank you, Kate. Wait. Uh, Wait, Bulls, Region 3. Uh, just a quick question. So, can the NIAA define 
homeless. Can we put a definition to homeless? Um, because, uh, for instance, a few years ago, uh, I sold my house and uh, I built another house. Uh, we moved it to an RV and my travel trailer, and my daughter was considered homeless that, during that time. Uh, I got, she could, she was eligible for free lunch at the school and everything. You're still living in Alamo, you know, but I built a house. I was building a house. We made plenty of money, but we were considered homeless because we were living in an RV and a travel trailer. Um, we didn't think we were homeless at the time, <laughs> but um, I'm just saying, uh, just, just kind of one thing, uh, is there a definition to homeless that can be defined um, for eligibility purposes? I'm just asking. Okay, so Paul, I need to counsel. Um, that's federal law, it would preempt state law um, as well as ours. Uh, the definition or, or how the law within the Mackenzie Picker Act describes uh, what a child in transition is, CIP doesn't understand the child in transition, if we're homeless, uh, I think what we have to go by. Um, but like I said, Lori, the fact pattern that Lori pointed out, the one you just pointed out, are, are I think things that could be questioned uh, if that's being used, because I think that is an issue. Okay, I'm going to go to Tammy and wrap it up. Tim, just a quick question. So I guess because I agree with you, I didn't help any of these. But what exactly can we do? I guess is my question. I know it's bringing up. I know it's a problem. But if you're saying you can't challenge any kind of federal law, because obviously it trumps. What can we? Do? I, I wasn't saying that, it, uh, that we can't challenge you know, any situation. I, what I'm saying is that law is a federal law, which means a federal law preempts state law. That, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a law to follow. But within that law, there are definitions and, and, and descriptions as to what constitutes a child in transition and or a total person. Uh, and therefore, you know, if we have fact patterns that don't quite fall within that, yet somebody's being put there, uh, a CIT student, then I think, you know, the, the, we, we can look at that from an eligibility standpoint. Right. Let's go to Matt. I, 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 I just have a good comment okay, about that. I, I think what would make it difficult for parents to use that loophole when we hold those kids to do an investigation that takes a while that word's going to get out and maybe that'll occur to other people because when they're in an investigation period currently for a while we're investigating we don't think the facts are like you know they're not eligible until our investigation is over well it's that it almost always said you know, uh, the cit organization and groups around the districts do not do an investigation there's no investigation. The parent is asked a question. The parent answers that question. The CIT person marks them homeless and marks them CIT. That's the extent. That's the issue that our office, and I'm sure throughout the state, is the issue here. And the issue is not whether the kid is CIT or not. It, the issue is, I want my kid to play. So what ends up happening in our offices is that once a kid becomes CIT, we red flag that and we look at it and overview it just to make sure there's no discrepancies. I can tell you that every year we get about three to four percent of CIT kids are being recruited by a coach, being recruited by a school, and going to that school because they're a CIT kid. We have had some success over the last couple of years of working with the CIT people from Washoe County School District to identify those. Tell you some examples of that is we've had my office call a CIT quote unquote kid call their parent and the dad said we're not CIT what's CIT mean? And we explained it to him he looked on we're in a house in San Diego my son just wanted to go play 
basketball up in Reno. <laughs> and so their office can't do uh, investigation, but our office can. Now we've had some some success in identifying who these kids are and stopping them from playing and breaking the rules. But the reality here is, is that um, most CIT departments don't have an investigator that goes in because they're not concerned about sanctioned sports and NIT and all of that stuff. They're just doing their job correctly, so they're doing a great job of doing that. But again, their primary focus, they don't care whether a kid plays basketball or not. My office does, but they're all discussing. This was just for discussion, Donnie. Anything beyond that that you see? Or just for some good conversation. Thank you very much. Let's go to item number 26. Let's go to page 221. Southern Base Football State Championship. We'll go through this, should be really quick. I'd ask Scott and Nelson, uh, Mr. Nelson, put this on the agenda because we need to confirm. Uh, I would like to publicly for Donnie to explain where at this time we do know that the state, the Southern State playoffs due to Formula One being in town, will be played on Tuesday. But the where, the sites, um, again, I asked Dr. Mr. Nelson to explain that these games will be played. Uh, thank you, President Sloan. Just uh, again, it's just a one per page only. Saturday, November 18th, we will have the 5A, uh, Class 5A Division Three state championship game for sure. We'll have one Northern team, one Southern team based on the playoff structure. That will be at Mackey Stadium again, Saturday, November 18th. The Class 3A and the Class 1A are also scheduled to be played Saturday, November 18th at Mackey Stadium. That's at the University of Adorino. So long as we have at least one northern team in the game. Uh, so again, those sites are possibly flexible three and one to another site, but then if we have two southern teams. The, the change for the southern base rotation state championship football games, again, I want to make it very clear, not because of Allegiant Stadium. It was because of Formula One and the race event that was scheduled on top of what is now our traditional state championship football weekend, again, Saturday, November 18th. Uh, that Formula One race goes all the way through there. So not knowing until recently where we were going to be, we were still going to have those games on Tuesday, November 21st, in the Las Vegas area. That gets off of the concerns of hotel rooms. I know uh, Mr. Stallworth and uh, in his office, uh, Ms. Evans trying to find hotel rooms. We got the first, like, we can't find any anywhere, let alone. 30 rooms together, let alone have rooms that are, you know, at affordable rate or anything meaningful. And then we also then heard follow up as well from our other liaisons and other schools to chime in said we've got some problems here. So as of right now, um, well, not as of right now, the 5A Division 1 is for sure on Tuesday, November 21st. 5A Division, 5A Division 1 is um, Southern schools only. By the way, Division Two is guaranteed a North team and a South team. So the rotation in this year is to be in the South. 4A, Southern based only, guaranteed to be in the South. And then the Class 2A, so long as we have at least one Southern team and that being the 2A, that will be played in the South. And uh, as of now, we have a commitment. We're, we're very blessed, right? I, I don't know many success other state associations have in the partnership and relationship that we have right now with our leadership team of Las Vegas uh, Raiders. So we are scheduled to be played in, in Allegiant Stadium. I'll make it very clear. We do not have a contract in place with Allegiant Stadium right now. This is not 100% guaranteed then. Uh, I hope we don't have to react, but we don't have any indications at all that we're going to have to overreact and go for Allegiant. We have all indications that we're going to be there. So I guess this serves as an official announcement. Uh, to the President, so if I made the comments, we do our very best as soon as possible to try and name what those sites are. Sometimes we can can't name sites until just later on or closer to an event because again we are as I'll discuss later another item you know we're kind of the on hold group uh, we don't have the ability to financially go buy out something uh, the Raiders I know are very are okay they don't want me to say this just not trying to play anybody's egos but you know the Raiders put an eight hundred 
a thousand dollar bill for us to be on the agent stadium. They do not own the stadium. They are also a tenant. And for a tenant to, to allow for another tenant to be in there, you know, in a, in a chain reaction, sometimes it takes a very long time to get in there. So all tenants are going to be in the region. I, we always want to announce as soon as possible. Many times it's just not possible in these venues to be able to do it. But anyway, I hope, hope that's what you're looking for, Mr. President. Okay, one minute. Let me get to Jason. Jason first. Jason Oliver, 3A liaison. Uh, just uh, contingency of the 3A is scheduled to be in the north if there is not an old team, it's two southern teams. Um, there might be somebody who would be interested in that. So just uh, is there a plan as to where that would happen if it's two southern? Uh, yeah, thanks from the staff. And it's hard to imagine trying to play five football games in one day, but that would be what we're looking at this point. And the Raiders, but need to give their blessing for that, just make it very clear. But again, uh, we're full cool confidence the Raiders, they're willing to work with us in many different capacities and we're very lucky. However, be, be very certain that there's not the possibility of playing six football games in there and there is not the possibility of getting the second day. It is only Tuesday, November 21st. So again, yeah, and I'll tell Mr. Davis, hang on, so yeah. Right, more of it, right? Okay, thank you. Or Davis and any staff. Actually, I actually had a chance to talk to Mr. Hayes from the Raiders on Tuesday morning about that very possibility of a fifth game. Uh, I don't want to use Mr. Hayes' words as gospel. He cannot speak entirely for the Raiders organization. What he did tell me is that we should have a contract to review by the end of the week. It's not ready to sign, it's ready to review. We talked about the possibility of a fifth game, and his response was, we'll do what we have to do on it. It, it would make for an extremely long day. We already go from 9 o'clock first kick, and we have four games to a 7 o'clock, give or take, last kick. It, it's really kind of stretching that out. Mr. Hayes did also reiterate, no shot at the second day. So if we end up with six, Somebody's going to get left out. Uh, but yes, five is, we can get there, a possibility. There's, there's a legal possibility we may only have three because the two I need to check. So we are prepared to do it. Thank you. We have a public comment to you. State Football Championship in Vegas. I just wanted to voice my concern for having the state championship in Vegas on the weekend of November 18th. Due to the Formula One race that weekend, there are no hotel rooms to be had with parents from the north to come down to Vegas. If there is a room, it's very low price. The traffic will be terrible as well. I realize this scenario is only valid if the home team is playing in the south, but we still need to plan ahead for accommodations, and that is not possible. Also, there is concern that it might be changed to a weekday that would just be terrible. Two parents cannot get weekdays off last minute. Please let the board know that parents from the north are very concerned about our boys getting the chance to go to state and not being able to watch them. Thank you so much for listening. Carol Jaco, Teresa Lentornio, and Mal Taylor. Thank you. Thank you again, Steph, for that. All right, we're going to move on right now to agenda item number 17. Please go to page 187. This is the master activity calendar for 2024-25 for discussion, which one of the large discussions is going to mainly be the fact that Formula One will be in Las Vegas. They signed a contract all the way to 2032. Right. And yeah, might as well be forever. Go down the strip, you'll see. But uh, that needs to take, we need to take a look at these. these these calendars and make some changes accordingly. Yeah, thank you, Brother Sloan. So again, I and I apologize for not having this written on here. Uh, I, I can bring it back home. Actually, really, it was meant to be a, a discussion about where we need to go with this. And if you look down under November 2024, so we're looking ahead of year and rotating where state football games would be on November 23rd with the 5A uh, division two, then rotating back to the north of the 4A side of the whole physical side of So. Um, I don't know, I'm confused now. My, my apologies. Anyway, long story short is that that Saturday, 
game on the 23rd for the rotation to be to the south will have to really be moved from here on to be probably a Tuesday game before Thanksgiving. I realize some districts are, some districts are not off um, on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. But regardless of Legion Stadium or not, as I mentioned earlier, the possibility of playing on a Saturday, the same Saturday in, in Las Vegas doesn't exist. So in the simple fix for going for next year, it's really to make those Southern based games be ready to be played on Tuesday. I know that's lost school time on Monday for those that are traveling. That's a real concern of ours. The other options we're going to talk about as we get into another calendar agenda item is possibly, you know, what, 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 what do we do with the football? Do we go, I don't know, we want to go on Thanksgiving weekend? Like we, uh, at least some places to say, I, <laughs> do we go into the first week of December, which we even used to be in a long extended playoff format, but we don't even have that playoff format that necessitates we play into the first week of December, or do we short company to start making? And finish the football together. We start possibly earlier in July. You know, finish finish a week earlier than this weekend altogether. We we'll get back on top of you know volleyball and soccer weekend. I mean, a lot of things to do. So this calendar was approved by the board. You know, the spring meeting. Leave it alone. I'll bring it back with the with the correct dates on the proposal for adoption our next meeting. We've got some time to do it, but that's what this is. Just address the way we do the Are there are there any other questions, Tammy? Go ahead. I just have one quick question, I guess. Um, are we looking at this because of the time frame for different, like, because you have to have the five days for football? Is that why it's an issue? Because every other sport plays on weekdays. So I guess that's my question is like, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy for parents, but baseball, softball, golf, everybody else plays on Wednesdays, Tuesdays, Thursdays. So I didn't know if it was we were looking at it on a weekend because of the five days or what the reason. No, this is this is all because of Formula One. There's we Rollins because initially if, if you saw for somebody to get a hotel room, you had to get three days. You oh yeah, to go three. There's just insane. there's no way possible that Rollins could get charter to hotel rooms. Any anybody it doesn't matter one, two, three, four to come down for accommodations. Just a cost alone, and that's why the the Tuesday, and that is something that we're having, we're going to have to consider more going forward for the for the that's all. That's okay. Yeah, that was just my question. That's not the conversation. Well, the other the other option would be to not play in the in the stadium and move the football championships to the north for the next ten years up up north in the snow. Our Saturday news are available. Our Saturday, our Saturday games are available for 10 years. So uh, we just lost the balloon races too. So uh, we're, we're ready. We got that weekend available too, man. And then we'll bring basketball down south. All right, Xavier Anthony. Uh, we've had this conversation multiple times. Uh, Tim is the English major in the office, and much more eloquent. So I love Tim to touch base about. <laughs> this is what I do with all this. What do you mean to know? Well, as we look at the calendar, uh, we have more to also consider a few other things that we're dealing with, uh, especially in particular in, in the South. And I know it's a northern issue as well. As we continue to push fall further and further, we continue to shrink spring smaller and smaller. As a result, we only had 40 days in this coming year in which to schedule all of our baseball and softball games on single sites because we are trying to end the season before Clark County graduates. I think the time now for the board to consider the fact that we need to join the rest of the union and consider going beyond graduation for our state championships in the spring, which would then free up our fall to allow us to have the option that we need to address everything. The problem you hit the nail on the head. We're getting to the point where we're going to have to move all of our Southern State Championships to the North. Formula One is not going anywhere. It's going to get bigger. And I have a real, real concern with this moving forward. The other thing is this. Well, I made a good point that maybe we move all the State Championships North. Yesterday, UNR's announcement 
about moving their basketball game just open Walmart potentially for us in the winter. That's another thing we need to explore, explore because if we move that, maybe we can move winter and do some things that are, that are on the grander scheme. But ending that calendar before CFP graduates put all the pressure on AP testing, that could go away, and graduation ceremonies, that could go away. It's a very huge dynamic shift that I think we have the opportunity to write here for it. Thank you. And I, well, I was following that. I agree with that. And I, I, I think we need to explore what that would look like as we go, go through that. I know Wyoming is a state that is one of those states that I think they play their baseball in the summer, the championship right after school's out. Iowa. Right. And their state baseball championship the weekend of the 4th of July. Okay. So, so it's not unheard of. It's being done. We, we are. We are playing seniors that have graduated from high school and they're finishing out their high school career. So it's definitely something that we need to, to, to look at and just address because it, it's not going away. Uh, so. We're one eye away. We're, we're getting this awesome. Well, you said it, one, the one impact that, that we experienced last year with CCSD and we're experiencing this year is that state playoffs is during the finals, finals week for us. And, uh, the schools did an amazing job next year, coordinate last year, coordinating with the kids and their finals. And so, yeah, we're, this is year two of that. Going on, we're going to All right, we're going to transition now to the 20. Deanna, did you have something to say? I think during the spring meeting, maybe Colin brought it up. What would happen if we started football week earlier? Wouldn't that help the fall sports and not cause the congestion at the end as well? That would mean, let's go back. I'm just, I'm just trying to talk about it. That's, if we moved everything back, I can just, again, you know, I say CCSD, that has an impact on our, our administrative staff is just transitioning back to work. Oh, we started the week earlier. Yeah. So, so we're having a hundred percent discussion right here about playing a game on a Saturday versus a Tuesday. Seriously, in later stadium, guess what? Up to the parents who can't figure it out, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> they have in the past, you know. They have and they will. No, no, you're absolutely. We deal with this all the time. Welcome to the board, Tony. <laughs> We're going to go now to item 23. Once again, please go to page 210. We're going to talk about, sorry, Kevin, did you have a comment? Go ahead. No, just regarding the comment about starting earlier rather than playing seniors after graduation. I think, well, I agree that site staff, admin staff, it's a stress around them, but I think that's something we could push through if that was something the if the choice was that or kids graduate and we're bringing that we have zero control over behaviors or reactions. And so, so I think earlier could be on the table if you wanted us to bring this site staff. It's going to require a lot of conversation. Thank you. All right, let's go to item 23, 210. All right, again, this is calendar 2526. I do not believe. This is, oh, okay, this has not been approved, so we can modify formula one. No, 2425. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Anderson just asked about possibly taking action on what we just discussed. That's 2425. It's not this year. We know for region for 2324, we know, we know we're bringing football on Tuesday. I will bring back the 2425 calendar data we just addressed in the next meeting. For approval with football amended to be on a Tuesday in the Southern Base games. Okay. So that's so that means we didn't have to take any action on that. So then we go to we've already preempted this discussion, right? Uh item 23, calendar for 25, 26. This is for discussion. And this is what we're just talking about. Here's the way it would look rolled out uh right now, staying in the same format through which we do. Again, please please ignore football in November. 2025 on those days on Saturday, 22nd. That's obviously going to have to be amended. This is really uh, conceptually from start to finish what the days would be. And look at that. Based on the comments we just heard, I think my direction would be to form a master calendar committee. 
to really review starting earlier, finishing later. On page 212, I could be wrong on those, but uh, again, I'm, this is not about the CCSD only by any stretch. But I, but I did note those dates. What I understand to be certainly saying, thank you. But it's really about these special events that happen on a regular basis in the Southern Nevada area. And again, I'm, I'm talking about EDC. And then we tie in, right, the AP testing, finals, graduation, the different districts that go extend for about a month in duration, really, from Clark County to a few other small districts that do end early, all the way to Washoe County and the lake. So you, you have it here. Let, let me get to a county committee, 25, 26, even though I'd love to get this going right now. And I left for discussion on purpose with the intent to, to notify everybody. We've got a lot of very, very different um, philosophies of what we should do with the county. I, I think that this is the first time that I've truly heard it, even though we've talked about it, that we would possibly consider finishing in June with championships, even after kids have graduated, leave the responsibilities on, on you know, administrators, coaches to make sure those students don't get themselves in trouble after they walk a uh, stage and still eligible. So but let, let's do that. I, I don't have any other comments to that, President Sloan, unless you want to make something, but we, we know we have a second committee meeting tomorrow. I know that we had a discussion column too. Do you have anything to add? Oh, why did I ask? Because Paul always has a question. I don't want to get called in. I appreciate that. Sorry, I'm the conversation. Um, yeah, I think echoing what uh, Kevin said, I, I, I don't think we're going to have a lot of support from CCSD principals on things happening after graduation. Um, I just think there's so many issues with that, just lack of control and kids kind of not feeling, like, yes, we want to hope that they like graduated and are ending on a strong, but then they don't, they're not successful. And then there are decisions we make because of that. Um, I think that one of the things that we had, we had discussed that I, I will voice that is definitely out of the control of this body, but I think there are some people in this room who like can start conversations on this. Is, and, it, and this may be a naive, like there are, 100 years of precedent as to why these decisions, these decisions have been made. But I'm wondering if there's a conversation that needs to be had amongst districts of like, why are we not aligned as a state, right? And like, is there a, a better alignment we can have in order to solve a lot of these problems, right? Um, and so, like I said, that's not the, this body's decision, but I think just for the record, putting it out there that those conversations, especially with all the things happening in Las Vegas, I'm sure our superintendent rep is. I'm going to put chime in, but like I, I think that um, you know, lots of things happen in Las Vegas that seem to conflict with various layers of this calendar, and I wonder if the calendar shift somewhere may help with that. And one of the large impacts on the special teams coming to Vegas, <laughs> one, and it, it's crazy out here. All right, let's go to Tammy, and then Tammy. Okay, right here. Um, when you create the calendar. Or the committee, I'm sorry, for the calendar. My biggest, I, I guess, maybe I, I'm looking around. There's not many of us in this third in the building. And that's where I feel like you have to have representation from the people who are sitting in the buildings because it does affect us differently than it affects someone sitting in the main, main area, right? Central, thank you. That's the word I was looking for, central office. And I think, too, we have to remember that. Yes, athletics, I mean, I used to complete athletics, but academics sometimes has to be looked at first. And I, I kind of disagree with Colin on this one. I think we may be able to get more people on board with the, pushing it back. Be, if, if it comes down to you have to push it back or your kids are missing, like my own son is the last six of the last 10 days of school because of the way this calendar falls and state and regionals and all of those things. And I think if we're really going to put academics first, we have to be open to, to just changing certain things. And maybe it is, hey, let's go past the calendar. Or And the, the thought of moving it forward, football any earlier, scares me because of the heat. I'm not, like, we already have issues in the South with kids falling out. And you just move it a little bit more. And we also, I mean, the weather, you guys deal with the weather up north with the snow. In the spring sports, we're dealing with the thunderstorms and the lightning and the all of those other things that we're just adding another week that we have to push things around. So I think on the committee, just please, please, please get building people that are sitting in buildings. 
in those discussions. I, I've already made the list of who's going to be invited on this calendar committee. So, uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Effect, just to, just to let you know, um, uh, just everybody knows, Mr. Knott and Sloan and I did have a, an internal discussion about meeting to this item and where we would want it to go in terms of, again, forming a committee, asking questions, people that are in the buildings to, to move to the point of uh, I, I, I threw out a, a fun little uh, note to uh, to Pam Teal, who's uh, our, our NAS uh, president this year, and about, you know what, at what point should I bring on the agenda in tongue in cheek about having all those school districts asking to get lined on start to finish day? She said, don't. <laughs> so, Russell, go ahead. Yeah, last month in uh, our NAS meeting, I had the joy of bringing up underneath the NIAA report standardized start school times and end times. Uh, the request of, of Pam and Donnie, and she was about not ran out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so so as, as nice as that would be, I think we all know that school start times and, and days and those things, um, I think it's very passionate right now that remain under local control at the school board level where, where they have the authority to do that. And I can take you down that road. Road and get sidetracked, but uh, calendaring for uh, the master calendar, you get the same response that our NAS group when we start talking about going any earlier into uh, August or July. Uh, it doesn't go over very well right now. In fact, there, there's already questions about why we're already touching the end of July. And I think many of us know uh, it's. Standard, you have two weeks prior to the start of your school year that you're bringing in administrative staff on two years or two weeks after the conclusion of the, the school year that you have administrative staff on is, is kind of a, a historic thing. Some districts may have a few more days of their administrative staff. Uh, some may have 11 month secretaries, but a lot of us out there still have, uh, you know, 10 days prior, 10 days after the school year, and you don't have any staff. And so Right now, we're starting a football season, practice heat acclimation with no support from school nurse or no administrative staff, no uh, secretarial support. So any earlier is a, is a big concern, more so than the idea of the extension. We, we've actually had this conversation around, I think it's a change of thought for us. We have kids we know are academically eligible it becomes on the behavioral side and the concern about what control we do have over them, but they're still attending practice. They're still attending games, just like we're doing for those that still start school until September, whatever. Um, we're operating the same way. It's just a thought. They're still under your control extracurricular-wise. They misbehave. You're just those things that they have to abide by. Their, their discipline function is still taking place, but it, it's a definitive change of thought. It would have probably kept me up at night during 10 years as high school principal trying to oversee that and think of it. But it would definitely be a just a mind shift in how you go about doing it. But I do believe you have a lot more support that way. And the spring coach in me, as you know, Rollins and I combated back and forth on this um, uh, a little while ago, maybe a couple times around my concept around football and everything being around football and we focus on that and then the spring coach to me gets really angry at the spring it ends up being one that is the sacrificial lamb uh that gets that and so i i just i caution the idea that football is through those things but i do think this is why we have the tools that are disposed to make sure so i i welcome that committee i think it's a lot of what we do to talk about Thank you. All right, we're going to close it up, Bob. Well, it's on 4581. Um, actually, actually, you answered my question about the possibility of being found open, but um, I want to thank Don and Dr. Flynn for the school district. We aren't that out of line. We have the same start date. Washington and Clark County have the same start date. It's a big issue, but it's so. It's, it, it was all about getting on board with calling about, hey, let's align counties. In terms of the two big districts in the state, we are back on a line. What happens is at the end. So, in terms of start dates on the top, just 
some problems with it. That was a surprise to me. I expected Clark to have her to start with the menu. So we can have a good in there. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to do one more agenda item, and I promise we'll take a break. Uh, and we can get my staff back because they have a training they have to attend. So let's, let's go to item number 24 on page 213 summary of schools dropping sports. Again, on 213, let's turn it over to Mr. Nelson. Uh, President Slumber asked in our last meeting that we bring this back to understand what is happening as we learn towards realignment and understanding basically it checks and balances for us to keep track of schools that are not. Not fulfilling their requirements uh, with regards to not only just membership, but looking at that, but obviously the, the current realignment cycle and what the penalties uh, may be going forward. For a personal note, there we, we've got three schools that identified, and we're never trying to call out schools and put them in positions to be recognized and, and not not an unfair manner, but in a manner that we don't want to make it. You know, conversation. So you see, with Cheyenne's girls golf, we put them in the there, and I have not officially notified. Same thing with Crystal Ray, and then same thing with Democracy Prep. Again, Paul, apologies to those schools, not trying to call them out. What had happened is we did receive notification, but it came through a different district. Credit to the Clark County School District uh, staff, to Mr. Jackson. As he gets those notifications, he instantly forwards them to our office staff. Greatly appreciated. And then we note them and go forward so it does it. And there, there are times where that, that announcement gets delayed coming to us for whatever reason. But of course, when we get that from, whether it be from the school directly or from the CCSD Athletics and Activities Office, we obviously do follow up with the schools to confirm that they are indeed dropping those. We haven't heard first directly. Yeah. We see what well, we, we did after getting notification of the schools and followed up with it. That, that was, it wasn't an issue. First and foremost, us. we got it first and foremost, most of these schools from your office, not first to us. And then that's all. We, again, we don't, we don't want to get into that. It's not, we're not trying to follow schools. So we'll, we'll fix it. Anyway, that's what you have. It's just an update. So we keep track of these, and these schools know that when they have dropped a program during the current realignment cycle, they are not eligible for postseason for the rest of the realignment cycle. And if you look at it as an independent status, as of right now, going to the next realignment cycle, they can't come back and add a program, uh, depending on when they do the next realignment cycle. Now we'll talk about building back into regular schedules without postseason eligibility, or that they just need to pick up their own games, especially if they bring it back a season later, if they know the penalties are for not fulfilling their, their schedule at this point. Yeah. That, that, that's what I've got. Okay, I just have a couple of questions. I think, Bart, this is you. Um, on this form right here, it did say, like, it just kind of down a year. It said, NIAA not officially notified of those three. Matter of fact, they were. Uh, they were included in the email. If that is not the process of notification, then would you please share? Because Mr. Jackson is set, scheduled for the South, and if the school notifies him, and he includes you on the notification that he sends to the school, if there's another step, please explain. Thank you, President Solberg, Davis, and I staff. What you see for all the other schools, they notify us directly, as they do on the form that they send in, telling us what sports they are going to have. When they drop a program, we do prefer that the school notify us on that, the same way they tell us they're going to have a program. I do appreciate Mr. Jackson sending that on to us, because we, did, we would not have heard it otherwise. For most three schools, but we do want to hear from the school directly so that we we have it right away. We can respond right back to them and say, "Are you sure?" Because this is what the, the process is now that you're out of this alignment for the remainder of the time, and that you go to independent status for the next one. So we do prefer the school let us know directly on that. And when you do see on there, and I not officially notified, we weren't officially notified directly by the school. We were notified. Through Mr. Jackson, and we appreciate that. Okay, my, my follow up question. Um, let's say in all these situations right here, and I think this is an important document as we go further, because I would expect that this this is a, and that my last ask was that every, at every board meeting that this is a standing agenda. Now, in regards to Cheyenne, one of our schools, all these schools right here, what are the consequences for them dropping the program? The consequences for any schools, anybody that gets added to this for the winter and the spring, they go on independent status for the remainder of the current alignment cycle if they wish to play it all in that second year. They also then, to show that they have established or reestablished a program, 
They are an independent status for the next realignment cycle. Independent status means they are not a part of the league. It's to make it a lot better for the schools that don't drop the program to know, hey, we can trust this school. We can play them, we can schedule them because when you drop a program, golf or cross country, maybe not so much because a lot of those are more multi-team events. But if you see a drop football, a drop soccer on there, that's really tough to try to find games as, as Christopher Simons referred to yesterday with Awakening Christian dropping football. It's tough to find a game in that spot. It's left those schools that do have programs and do follow the rules and do establish it all the way through. It puts those schools in a bind now because somebody else dropped. Mark, are they independent in that sport only? Yes, in that sport only. Not all sports. Correct. Correct. So let's take away the Christian who's at the top of this, for example. They're still playing volleyball as part of the two-way zone. They, if they bring football back next year, it's independent. They have to get their own schedule. Mr. Fitzsimons of Lincoln County, if he wants to schedule them, he's free and clear to do that. Awakening goes also on independent status for the remainder. And that's something that Mr. Jackson, I believe, you have kind of pushed for uh, in your time still as a liaison on this board. That was something we had talked about as well because we don't want to have a program we're here, we're not, we're here, we're not, we're here, we're not. It creates a whole lot of a lot of problems. Do you like the president? Correct, which we're still facing in the south with the schools in the southern region that is trying to do just that exact same thing as for drops or as for in the middle of the alignment site. It was to, it was to clean it up. And it was more of a 3A issue than it was anywhere else as though the programs are, are struggling to keep their schedule school. And we also don't want to have, as we added a couple of schools, okay, we're going to have football this year, we'll have soccer next year, and then we'll have cross country the year after. It's impossible for the schools that are full members of that league to schedule out and have any idea if that school's going to have that team. And we don't know until July, start of August, for a fall sport. Third question. Hang on, Sean. Go ahead. Thank you, Slow. Uh, staff and the uh, board. Yeah, I agree with Bart on that. So, top of the list, Awakening Christian, they had dropped. And it's mostly with these liaisons wanting to agree. We can handle this as a lead, which is great. But I was just telling Jason here that next year, if Awakening comes back in and says, hey, we have football, they are independent, and they know that. But as a league, we're not required to play them because why would I want them on my schedule if I don't know if they're going to have a team where I can go out and get another game instead of a waiver? So as a league, we usually handle these things in house. Uh, but we had talked to Bart and July when they going to talk to us. And obviously, as league president, I advise them to let's wait and see. I mean, they dropped on July 25th. Uh, but again, I mean, it's a scheduling thing. It's, we can put all our league games in October unless they drop it. You never schedule a week of film. I mean, you schedule needles or white money, you know, they're going to have teams. Jason? Jason, we're here at 3A liaison. Um, just maybe to expand a little bit further, uh, in the 3A, we've had some concern about schools that come in for membership. They offer one sport for the boys, one sport for the girls each season, and then they end up dropping one of those. Sport, you know, one school for this one already. Um, what, what is the repercussions for, for a program like that? From a sports standpoint, it's the same thing. You drop, you go to independent status. Mr. Nelson would probably have to address if the school would start doing that multiple seasons, multiple sports. How we would address that? I handle it on a sport basis, but. Um, that's something to do the sport can address. So if we have a school that, say, puts it out there, hangs the chain and falls, same thing in winter, same thing in spring. Well, now we've got a little bit of a trend here, and we need to take care of that from either a regulation standpoint or in some other fashion. We can do it as well. We don't want this team here anymore, this school here anymore, but this is what they're going to keep doing. We also, I know Mr. Jackson's working with the school, says, hey, I'm thinking about having this team. Can you include me in the schedule? We need to stop that. My third question to you is what type of communication or follow-up was sent by the NIAA in these types of situations? 
Did you send a communication to Awaken, Cheyenne, Crystal Ray? I, I did send it when we got directly to me or to our office. Uh, let's use Awaken as an example. Sent one right back to them immediately and said, You understand that these are the consequences. Are you sure you want to do this? So it was an email communication back to them to say, You're going to be out for the next uh, the time you thought it was two because it is the alignment thing. They also, who was it? Sage Ridge back on July 20th. We went three emails back and forth with their new athletic director. They said, You really understand this. Do you want to wait for another couple of weeks to see if you have more kids? Before you make a call on this, because you're sending it right out altogether. Um, we thought you're, you're putting your program in independent status and how it will be altogether in the next several years. Is that something you really want to do? And I got the email back saying, We understand, and we just don't have kids. And when you get something like that, I don't know from our end what we can do other than say, Hey, you know, thanks for the communication. Did I send them out to all school or not? My memory is about three minutes long. Anymore. I thought I did, but there's a possibility that somebody said you could crash. So I, I would, for that. I would suggest that you create a formal letter. This is huge. Realignment is huge. Mm -hmm. Because that will avoid, because I, we don't need somebody to stand up here in the podium year two and say, well, we're waiting for that. No. Right. But I would suggest that you create a formal letter in a situation such as this. It is sent to the schools. And it's sent to the district office, athletic office, so everyone's on the same page. Because I can see some of these schools coming back exactly. next year and say, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I would also suggest that staff sends out a reminder to all schools statewide explaining what happens if you drop a program during the realignment. What happened to year two and then three and four and so on and so forth. Also, the fact that Mr. Jackson had to deal with I'm thinking about having a team. Maybe I'm scared. I don't know. It's just great. Just thinking about it, you know. And then we had another situation. I'm asking Mr. Jackson to come up, but we had a school that, hey, we have a soccer program. You didn't include me in the schedule. Well, that school didn't come forward and confirm with you that they had a program. A lot of situations, a lot of stories. You know, we need to curb that. We need to end that because it's a nightmare. From somebody that used to do schedules, and I understand, I mean, it's twofold now with Tim does, we can't, he had to redo that entire schedule just because he had to accommodate that school. Tim, why don't you step up? So you've seen the data, Barbara. I share that with anybody. The link, you can go look at it anytime you want. Um, what we're facing with is a tipping point in the South. We are we are there. Which bench we still up here? The tipping point is this. We have over 3,400 scheduled events in the southern 3A, 4A, 5A. This morning, I had it set up that it alerts me when we hit a certain number. We have changed 21% of the schedule. One out of every five games on the schedule has been rescheduled, not once, but sometimes twice. And that even takes it into account by the We don't even kind of like it. We went like um, and, and what we're getting to this is uh, an overpromise, underdeliver, and and we talked to Dave. We had a conversation with Dave. It's not a not a charter issue. It's not a private issue. It's a Southern Nevada school issue. I think you're probably facing it in the North as well. We're going to lose efficiency. We're going to lose transportation. Can I keep this pace up? And while this is beneficial, the other problem we're facing is I'm going to offer three levels. Uh, I'm going to offer two levels. Oh, wait, I'm going to offer one level. Those are all changes. We have preemptively scheduled football, the football, freshman football, after a commitment date. Schools commit once they see the have a school. If we would not have done that, that number of 746 changes in the first six weeks of the season would be over 1,200 because it would be 465 additional changes as opposed to adding 82 in. Soccer. Was even worse because of the new soccer. We're talking about systemic change to how we schedule in the South. We need consistent. The other problem we're facing with this is also the same. Schools come in without the proper facilities to host events. You cannot host a tennis match on two courts. You 
must have a football field secure to play football. I want to give credit to schools like SLAM who are preemptive. They are, they are prepared. They go out and get everything in their place. But what I'm afraid of is the other issue we're going to start facing is this. I come in with two sports in the fall, two sports in the winter. I don't feel the team, so I don't want independent status. Is my membership now in jeopardy because I'm not the two teams that are full membership? We have, we have a school that I, I think we should look at that has changed the sport they're offering in the fall winter. They are now going to be on independent status. Are they officially offering the two sports, one for boy and one for girl, as they are required? Because we don't we won't be able to schedule them in bowling. There is no wiggle room to add independent status bowling. You don't know how they're going to get into games. We're, we're, we're restricted in the number of planes we're allowed with facilities and the matches with the host. So I'm very concerned that this list is going to get longer and it's going to have more impact. And I'm afraid that what's going to happen is we're going to wait for the last minute to drop. Uh, Tammy can attest to the team issue that you face with the 4A, 5A. Jason can attest to the 3A. Fortunately, we have a great relationship with, with Sean. Thank you. Um, but we've actually had some four and five A schools play two A schools in sports this fall. We are we are we are going everywhere we can. But I'm, I'm concerned as this drops continue, and as we have more charter schools online, and I don't think anybody you know this is in a charter fashion. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, I think we need to have consistency from the board as to what sports they offer and how they offer them, so that they come on and they have success because we're setting them up for failure. Thank you. Thank you. So, so again, the, the takeaway from this, I think, that, I think I would again would like to ask staff to put it in a memo together to go to all schools as a reminder, and maybe some situations, some scenarios, and Bart, any time um, that a that a school drops a program, then again in a, a formal letter, not just a hey, you're going to do this, think about it, or an email going back and forth. I think this the realignment's huge. Those of us that have been around doing this for a long time. We just cringe when we're sitting in these meetings and coaches and parents and schools and principals. It's it's a nightmare. So does anybody else have any comments, questions you want to add, Matt or Redman? You know, I just maybe back off of what you said. I would make it a form the park sends out that they sign. So you have a signature, maybe mail we'll back to you. Wait, there's the confirmation. So Okay, we're going to just put things on hold right now. We have a guest speaker. I'm going to bring forward Dennis Aldridge. If you would please, um, we're going to give you, you have three minutes at the mic, and then after that, you guys will take a break. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, it won't take me three minutes. But, yes, um, so, for the record, introduce yourself. For the record, please, full name and uh, Affiliation. Thank you, sir. All right. My name is Dennis Aldridge, and I'm a 30 year resident of Las Vegas. And I've been involved in youth sports in the private sector for about 20 years. Um, and sitting here listening to you guys today, um, there are a lot of issues that um, seem like we need help with, and that's the reason I'm here. Uh, I'm asking you guys for help in uh, facing some inequities uh, with our student athletes and our parents, uh, possibly bringing the private high sector uh, to the governing body for all activities in the state of Nevada. And I've been speaking the last couple of years with one of your members about some of the ideas 
that I have implemented um, with the organizations that I've worked for. So um, I would like to be added to the agenda to um, help you guys out. Obviously, you know, there's it seems like we don't have a big support system for uh, our student athletes. I would think that um, more parents would be here offering you guys help in the issues that you're facing. So that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm working with a current high school desert oasis um, in some of the items that are facing them today. So however that looks, if I need to be added to the agenda, we can form a committee to work together to help our student athletes and our parents. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Yes. Look, Dennis, sorry. Ben said just to follow that. Uh, moving forward, if you would please send, send us correspondence and be encompassing all that you're, you're proposing here, what that is, you know, uh, I just, just need to learn a lot more. Yeah, I'm, okay. That's yeah. pretty much it. I'm asking for help and uh, helping you guys. So I, I have put together a panel of experts from across the country, from executives to trainers to mental health, um, world-class athletes to ultimately help NIAA. And I'm, I'm not gonna spell out the plan that I've used for the last 20 years to help develop multi-million dollar leagues. Uh, all of that can be proven. If you guys would, would like to have my help and the people that are with me, then someone will reach out. And again, I don't want to engage in the with public comment. Maybe just a, a summary of what you're doing with Desert Oasis High School, you had mentioned. Yeah. Maybe just send some correspondence to me about that, if you would, please. What uh, just factual areas, topics, what support that is in definition, descriptions of how you're providing that support. Just, just want to see. Something so we know what, what what we're kind of what we're getting at. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, you guys. At this time, we're going to take a break till eleven o five. Tia, is this, lunch is at eleven thirty. Eleven thirty to one. Okay. At eleven thirty, we're going to come back and talk financials. So be prepared. All right. Thank you. So again, please return to eleven five. Yeah,
tell them to call it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Marco, we're excited for you. Yeah, Marco, we're excited for you. All right, you guys, since we convened the remaining uh, topics, I do believe are discussion that probably shouldn't take that long. Le uh, lunch is coming at 11 30 but there has been a strong recommendation that we have a eating lunch i don't have a problem with that so as this discussion take place feel free to to go get lunch so at this time let's go back to number nine on page 36 yeah. uh, the financial report mr b's Meyer. Okay, we talked yesterday, um, we went over current financials, which like I said, only went through September 14th. Um, everything's in order as, as far as I can tell, um, heading into the, the year, I've got a um, few items to, to address, you know, as far as, um, People owing for activity cards that maybe you know having to pay for stuff like that, but nothing, nothing uh, big there. And then we went over the audits, uh, item B, 2022-23 NIAA and NASC audits, and and we also discussed the proposed budget and the changes uh, that were made uh, from the budget that was presented back in June. So at this point, I'll just open it up for any questions for those who. Uh, we reviewed all the financials last night. Um, any questions? Yes, I, I also have um, in, in reviewing that, page, you did go back, you know, you only go back two or three years. If you're looking at that, and you're looking back at the salary increases in the department uh, over the last two or three years, those have gone up significantly. From a, from a yearly aspect, from a yearly budget aspect to it. And am I the right thing from page 70 to 79? There, the actual, the total figure for salaries was $387,112.98. And, yeah. and I budgeted 386000 okay. That is remarkable. I got it that close. Okay. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is amazing. So, with that being said, uh, and, and, and those increases, in, in, except if we go back to 2021, 2020, those kind of things, those salaries have gone up that much. I mean, I don't find that it's gone up pretty good as far as the percentage standpoint. We are still understaffed. And we're looking for funding. Uh, it seems like I know it was brought up yesterday that I think one of the Increases in student fees was going to go, and, and that money was going to go towards staffing. Compliance. Compliance. Officer personnel. Okay. All right. So I'm, yeah. looking, I'm looking at, so that, is that the only um, move that we're looking for as far as staff improvement and taking up just getting a compliance officer or something along those lines or two people for that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. yeah, and again, thank you guys and the staff. Uh, President Sloan and I will address that officer with the superintendents on November 2nd. The intent is you'll you'll see in item 22, I've got goals and objectives. Uh, we'll, that that's part of that process. But if, if I were to answer that question here and now, the intent of any extra revenues generated from the increase in membership dues. Would be for staff to be enhanced for compliance purposes, transfer purposes to deal with that specifically. That's the intent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you look on page 92, where it says on uh, the top about the staff history, you'll see the, the increase of, of, of the staff office there 
and, and that taking place there. And I know that we're understaffed and, and, and that's still not enough, which is, I think, a good thing. But um, we still need some more staff there to, to come in. And I just want to know where those, those funds are coming from and uh, as we move forward. That's all. That's the only question that I have. Yeah, we did discuss uh, an increase in membership dues and then the figures that were presented there, you know, plus $70,000 to the budget or plus 40 at, at 25 cents. Uh, and I did mention yesterday that FERS has now gone to 33 and a half percent. And when I first started here, I think it was 22 cents. It keeps going up and and what that means is when we hire somebody, um, basically whatever their salary is going to be, if we're going to hire somebody at a $60,000 salary, we've got to add 34 benefits. This is how that really computes out. Uh, and when all the benefits are added into someone's salary, it's, it's usually about half of what their salary is. Any other questions? Wait, I'd like to make a motion. To approve this amazing financial report, we have to do each one independently. Yeah. Okay. Um, I move to uh, approve the current financials. Oh, it's really second. We have a first, we have a second. Any further questions or discussion? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, the one with the question. I'm funny. Sorry. We don't have any money budgeted for the top 10 student athletes. Can we add that in later somehow? Well, we can certainly have a top 10 program. Oh, okay. Uh, just, I did not budget any okay. money for that budget. because we have not had that for the last couple of years. And I wasn't uh, um, wanting to have to increase the revenues any more than I did. Okay. Uh, but we certainly have the money available. And we don't have to do that right now. So, you know, if we're going to have a top 10 program that we know we're going to have and, and they can properly budget for it, but uh, there are there are other things uh, that have not been budgeted, like appeals revenue and, and those type of things that we never know what we're going to get. We know we're going to have revenue from it, uh, but I, don't, I can't predict what it's going to be, so I don't even put it on there for revenue. So there are a couple of revenue items that you know what, we've had money in the past. And, and if, you, if you look at the budget on page 90, we're talking budget here, right? 94, it was at the page. What was it? 92 cents. Um, if, you, if you look at the revenues, uh, other revenue, where we had money in the past, and that's the middle column, um, we had appeals and fines. We had twenty-one thousand dollars worth of revenue in appeals and fines last year. I didn't budget any for that because we don't know what we're going to get in appeals and fines. And people, we know we're going to have revenue. In it. I mean, uh, so I I try not to budget for items that I just you know what could be zero. Just to let you know how I go about this. I do have one quick question. Um, Bobby Orton's position, the funding for his position, does that position still exist? That money's been absorbed. Okay. Okay. All right. We have a first and a second. Any other questions or comments? All right. We'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. Right. Those opposed, the ayes have thank you. We will go to B. Shall I look at we also reach the three items to approve the 2022 2023 NIAA and NASC file? Thank so, you. We have a second. Questions, comments? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. We'll go to C. Wade. Wade Olson, H3, I believe to approve the 2023 2024 proposed budget. Waiting for the 12th and time, the second. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, seeing none at this time, all in favor say aye. 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 
all opposed. All right, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. We will get going here. Let's move to page 196, uh, item number 19, Future Realignment Committee. Bart, Bart Davis. President Slaw. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. We were going through the regulation changes about the realignment committee. We'll come back before this board in its January meeting for approval. We're doing things just a little bit differently this time around in that we are, before we have a realignment committee, we're having some meetings with coaches at each sport. That's a group that has been underrepresented throughout this process. And, and I know some of you in this room have been involved in realignment for 14 years, give or take. I've been in a lot of those meetings over that time as well. We have a lot of principals, we have a lot of administrators, we have a lot of athletic directors. Is it working for coaches? And that's what we're starting to find out. Last week, uh, Ms. Hamid, Mr. Polzian joined me, Mr. Hartman couldn't make it. He's got a new job and he's busy 37 hours a day. We talked to the winter sport coaches of the South to say, what needs to change? What's working? We don't want to throw the entire process out, but we want to make sure it's working for as many people as possible. I personally don't want a committee in place until we've had those meetings with the coaches. We don't want to violate any open meeting laws. This is just a little form so the coaches feel comfortable enough that they can give their honest opinion on stuff. It's not going out everywhere. We are asking them, please talk to your other coaches, talk to your colleagues. You're the representatives. Come forward to us. And when we told those coaches in those meetings, we want to meet with you again, personally, after your season's over, to know if it's still with you. Because you're going off the last time cycle, we're in a new one now. What do we need to do going forward to make sure this works as well as possible? Mission a bit. That's the thing I want to do with your group as well. The North is a little bit different, and then we've got a lot of schools right now that are set that want to be in the top classification. A lot of schools are set that want to be in the three A classification. There's only a sport or two where there's a little bit of confusion. But we need to get together North and South on where does that top classification really fit best. So I'm talking with President Sloan, Governor Department, to make sure we have the people that can represent best on that realignment committee. One thing we've talked about is we don't necessarily want voting members of this board to be voting members on the realignment committee so that they're not basically proving what they've already approved. We want some different voices in the room too. Some of us have been through this drill so darn many times we can recite it in our sleep. We want some new ideas to come in as well to make sure that what we're doing is right. If you don't ever have any new ideas, you can't challenge the one you got right now. So it's it's going to be a bit of a process. We are meeting with the spring sport coaches in October. That's the meeting surprise. We can set that up for the next couple of weeks. But those are just Zoom meetings and they're half hour. Voice your concerns, voice what you like. And then we'll ask questions like, what if we did this? Is it something you'd support? The, the, the bowling meeting, especially, that, that we had was extremely enlightening. We are also finding out that coaches are like, yeah, we, we really want to be part of this. And then we get to the meeting, and they're not there. So it, it, it works both ways, but you can count on us coming back in January with what we propose as a realignment committee for this board to take a look at, approve, amend, reject, whatever you'd like to do, and, and then we'll get started on it. Part of the hold on this that developed in the last couple of weeks was exactly what we went through yesterday. It came through the legislature, what was in some of those documents that were returned to figure out a timeline. We, Mr. Anderson, I think are pretty confident in that the LCB would allow us to do two years, then three. Yeah, I, I, I do understand. If that's the case, clock starts down. And then we start doing that. I am keeping a rubric for all sports. It's going to be up to the realignment committee, whether or not they choose to use that information. That realignment committee is going to have a lot of freedom to make some decisions. Maybe we haven't made it at this point. Uh, there's, there's a rumor of who's going to be the chair of this committee, but 
I think it's going to be the guy holding the microphone who's not looking forward to that at all. But it, it'll be a chore. But I know that we're going to have the right people in the room that can guide us there. And what we do eventually bring back to this board to vote on is going to be the best that we can come up with. President Sloan, I've said enough on the short question. Yeah, I have just a couple. Of, that, that's a little, I highly suggest that you, you can have it. Uh, the chair of the, this, this is a shift. And I'm going to be honest with you because in years past, Rollins and I have flip flopped and being the chair and then the consultant. I know when Mark Thompson uh, was in the position, he was there. I was his co. It's always been a board member to lead that. That's a shift. That's a change. And that's maybe something we need to have a discussion. I'm in support of that um, with the board. I'm just curious, and I too agree, we should not have voting members on the committee that turn around and vote, vote on what the committee voted. That never made sense to me. What is it, and I know what I mean, I'm going to turn this over to Donnie. What are you looking at for the makeup of the next real one? Turn it back on the sticks. Not sure. That's kind of an open end question. I'm not sure what you're looking for there in the answer. But from a committee standpoint, one of the things I want to do that we haven't done, and I want to bring Mr. Simons in on this because he's here. Uh, Mr. Bix in the meeting too. He'd like to comment on it. We went through a process for this last cycle where our 1A and 2A representatives basically had decided what they wanted to do for the entire year at the end of the fall. And then they kept coming back to the meetings to vote on stuff that didn't really involve them. And in some cases, they were the deciding vote for what the 3A, 4A, and 5A would do. I want to have a subcommittee on each side where there's a 1A, 2A subcommittee. If they're going to stick with enrollment, then they're going to be the people that decide what's best for the 1A and 2A. And they don't have to keep coming back to determine whether the North goes 4A or 5A in a certain sport. They have no dog in the fight. Let the 3A, 4A, 5A people work together to hash out what it is they need to do from there. In terms of how many classifications, we're locked into five based on what is, what is passed through. Uh, we worked on yesterday, it was in the LCB language. What we do with certain sports, again, I think that's open to the realignment committee. I, I'm not a huge proponent of let's go for more championships. We have 123 number schools. We can't to be some. But at the end of the day, this whole thing really needs to be about trying to get kids in situations where they're more competitive more regularly so that we're not losing kids, we're not losing programs, we're instead of building them. One of the pieces of feedback we got in one of the coaches' meetings that kind of happened after the meeting was from a coach, basketball coach, who said, you know, this is so great for our school, for our program. We had never been in this situation. We were losing kids to flag football. Now I've got kids that actually want to come out and play basketball. And we're going to fill three teams because of it. That's the kind of stuff we want to work towards. Is it going to be perfect for everybody? We want to make it as best as we can for as many of the schools as many of the programs. I'm not sure if that was your question. You didn't answer my question. I, think. I was, my question was, what is the makeup? Because typically ah. we, the board, when it's time to recommend the committee, we, the board, make those recommendations. I am just asking that in your preliminary thought process right now, what's the makeup look like? 1A, 2A, 3A, how many, what are you looking for? Liaisons, administrators, uh, the administrators being APs, being principals. What do you envision the realignment committee to look like? <laughs> Uh, Minus me and Ron. You want Ron? And Ron and Ron and you, you're welcome to come and come to play. I'm looking right now from three to four, eight, five, a four, north to south, four to five from each side, a mix of principals, athletic administrators, and athletic directors. For the two A one A side, you're on the spot, Mr. Brooks Simons. You're, you're somebody that I want on that committee, you and Mr. Brooks. So we have to go to this other component from the 1A because they do have full capital of more schools. I'm looking at four people one from the central, one from the south, one from the east, one from the west. Mr. Vic, 
going to be surprised by this too. He's on my list of people that I want on there. He's got that depth of knowledge, but I also want to get principal representation from the 1A as well, because that's a group that really hasn't been well represented. Liaison wise, we certainly want the charter schools represented. We want the private schools represented. I'd like to have one or two other people in the room as well, the resource people. As long as so you're more than welcome to be some of those people. I want some depth of knowledge, but I also want people who have not been on the committee before to come in and help us do things. I'm looking at a grand total, probably 22 to 24, before we break those out. And how are you going to that go about communicating or reaching out to these individuals? Now that we know what the timetable is, which we found out yesterday, within the next week, I'm planning to email them and then follow up with a phone call and say, look, this is what we're planning to do. We'd like you to be a part of this. Do you want to be a part of this? We follow up with everything that we're going to do and let them know this isn't one meeting. This isn't two meetings. This isn't commitments. We do need you to be willing to be here and this department can vouch for how much of it. Don't tell me it was local meetings last night. We'll, we'll make sure that's conveyed this time. But we do plan to have meetings similar to what we had during this last cycle, where we do need to go over timeline policy and procedure to make sure that that's accurate. And we do plan to sort of align again, season by season, so long as after those first couple of meetings where we set timeline policy and procedure, the realignment committees in favor. Okay, just so we're clear, come January, you're going to reset that, and then the board will vote because you've run from them. You don't from them. Run something that we get the to use there. Yeah. Yes, that's that's when we will uh, we'll hit the ground. Yes, Rollins and I'll be more than happy to be consulted. Yes, thanks. You can be more. Nope. It's Mr. Davis, I'm proud to be on the committee. Uh, you have big comments in me. It's just that the word realignment is still a bad word uh, for my wife and my personal background, but I'm willing to accept the challenge and still be on there. And I think on a serious note that. Getting, uh, we have Mr. Mike Strong all those years as a high school principal and athletic director, and so it does not all be missed, but I think one to a can benefit from getting some of these individuals um, in those leadership roles to know because a lot of people come away from that saying, they don't know what we're talking about. Well, you're more than welcome to come with me and need to see how difficult the process is. Reshuffle. Use that word. Exactly. No, that's a good point. We have a lot of people individuals sitting around the table that should be included in, in that as well on no. that side of the table. All right. All right. We're going to close that out. Lunch is here, so feel free to go get lunch. We're going to go through this. We've asked that we just have a working lunch right now, so feel free to get something. We only have a few left. Let's go to item number 20 on page 197, top 10 athlete scholarship. Yeah, yeah let's, let's most of these items we can talk through why we're eating lunch with uh you know the I know some people want to travel plans and work plans. So press number okay, let's let's take 15 minutes, go get lunch, everybody together. Once everybody settle back on the table. Again, I, I don't mind talking while I'm uh, about food in my mouth at the same time. <laughs> so wait.
Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to go back to item number 20 on page 197, top 10 student app scholarship. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Nelson. President uh, Sam, Member Riddle, why we don't have per se, not that we can't do it, but money budgeted right now for our top 10 student athlete scholarship banquet is I am not planning on having a banquet this year, and here's why. The bank, the, the uh, application itself, I just want to give you a copy of that. It's uh, pages 198 through 204. The omission that we have, in my opinion, made an error forever and ever is that we have not included spring sports season for this awards program. So those invites the senior based um, awards program. We've always ended it right after the winter season. Sometimes we ended it before the winter season and didn't take that. But speaking previously from a, a, someone who graduated with a very high level spring sports season my senior year, not getting to have that, I'm sorry, not getting to have that included in honors and recognitions that I was fortunate enough to receive after my high school career. Ending this early and depriving seniors of that last 12th season, especially if they're at the top of the list of a track and field athlete, possibly specializing in baseball, softball, swimming and diving, boys volleyball now, and boys golf, especially in those individual base sports where you really more or less excel as a senior, it's just, it's just not fair. But if we do that and we include a senior spring sports season, that often takes us to some degree, you know, obviously through late May, but even then waiting to get GPAs and final grades as well through transcripts, that takes us through some districts through the middle of June. At that point, once we get a committee, if we wait that long, get a group together, evaluate the applications, say the applications are due June 20th, trying to determine winners within a week or two, then we get into July. Those student athletes to have a banquet without them, they're gone. They're ready for college. They're not going to come back. But we're not going to obviously deprive the, the contributions of, of money that, that's still built into the budget of the $1,000 project. So anyway, that, that's my biggest thing with this, is to me, having that spring sports season for seniors outweighs having a banquet. I don't see there's any way we can do both if we wait that long. Now, if there's disagreement in the group, Please do it. I know as adults, we love banquets, we love honoring students. In the past, we used to do these top 10 award banquets in person and have the students come up and tell us about what high school sports meant to them and you know, speak publicly, have a nice dinner. It, it was, it was a wonderful event. But again, I think it's time that we need to really take in the fact a full, true athletic career for high school student athletes who graduate. So you know, the two just don't work. Uh, maybe if we look at multi sport patterns uh, and do a top 10, but the part of the requirement would be multi sports. So, if the sport is in the spring and uh, uh, they play baseball, softball, volleyball, track, whatever that, that spring sport is. But they're playing basketball and football or another sport. Um, that could be a condition of it, and then they are including spring sport athletes in that because that's one of the multi sports that they're doing. Maybe something like that. Uh, and thank you, Wilson. So our committee looks at as preference those student athletes who excel in multi sports. That that already is a consideration among the other three components of students in the community, obviously academic standing within their graduated class. But those that participate in multiple sports, right, wrong, or different, do get more favored by our committee because they're the most an athlete. And so again, that leads to exactly why we want to include the senior spring season. So, uh, and, Sorry, I never saw Jean come back for a second. Uh, never so said when they receive it, it's a thousand, it's a thousand dollars for a Sean, it's time to a liaison. Uh, yeah, we had we had an athlete that was affected by that. Uh, she won 
four track medals at the state level last year. Senior, she played for the 4.0. She wasn't a top 10. I mean, she was in the running, I guess, but being slight. I totally understand that Mr. Nelson's uh, comments there. Uh, what about this idea? We have a June board control meeting. Make the application deadline for May 10th or something, May 15th. And then in June, you present winners or on the agenda somewhere. Either have the principal show up and talk about the kid, or have the kids there, mom or dad show up and accept the, the award because we always have a June board control meeting. Again, just throw it out. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I can answer that question. And again, it runs into a little bit of a, of a a little bit of a time issue on that. Now, first of all, we have a board meeting in the summer board meetings in the South. We wouldn't have the Northern people be able to recognize. Uh, the second part, again, because of the ending time of districts, and actually getting final GPAs, look at that. We might not get those until right before the board meeting anyway. And we still have to have a selection process as soon as we get those. I appreciate your comments, time frame wise To me, that just doesn't look quite line up. Sir Anthony. Ready to get that microphone. Xavier Antilma, uh, Athletic Directors Association. Um, I still think this is uh, an important piece that we need to continue. Uh, the awards program, if it needs to be tweaked, it needs to be tweaked. But I think we have so much positive things that are going on. We hear a lot about the negative. But yeah, we need for a positive program to be put away because of a minor piece that can be fixed. Um, again, I know that we've had the more several in the past. It's been fantastic. I know uh, maybe we need to look at getting a sponsor to, to host it and, and do it not. But let's not lose sight of number one, this is for kids. And number two, uh, that because of something that's on a piece of paper that can be tweaked, doesn't mean that because of a minor piece that we have to kill an entire program. I understand that. Uh, we have that situation with those spring athletes. And I know that Sean just brought up an idea, but we've got a lot of ideas that are inside that box. Let's expand that box and, and let's keep some of that open case. Uh, and David, and thank you, Donald's from staff. When we're not killing the program, we're still recognizing the people, still putting out a cost for these, we're still putting together you know, a program if we can do it. It's just the timing of only, we're only talking about the banquet. It, it's not the, again, it's not, it's not having the lack of finances to not have a banquet. It's not. That. That it's just if we were to offer a banquet, realistically, it's not going to take place and be able to take place until we get everything done until mid July. I just don't think student athletes are going to come back and attend the banquet in the middle of July. That, 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 that's all it's all about. Yeah, Mr. Beck. I don't know. I, I'm trying to be supportive on, on the concept of moving it later, but no, I don't. I sit here and I think we, as a high school principal, having graduation scholarship nights before uh, graduations, that's what many, many of our organizations go off of is a point in time check to look at a whole body of work that's, that's been there. Uh, having students that have won this award, uh, knowing what that importance for them was, to know that they were able to have the medals in front and being recognized prior to graduation or at graduation was a huge, huge deal for those kids um, and their families. The banquet was amazing to be able to go to the Rito and, and sit, um, probably more so than the thousand dollar check they were receiving, um, if I'm being honest. That that meant a lot to them. Uh, I, I, I think it's a conceptual thing. If it's about making sure that you have the exact GPA on the student at the end of their graduation, and that's really important to your group, then you're going to have to wait. If it's about, I guess I'd be curious, how many of those student athletes that you're giving top 10 awards, does that last very end of their senior year matter in baseball? If they receive an MVP award, is that the piece that's going to Send them over the edge, or is it looking at your qualifications? I don't think that sends that kid necessarily over the top because it's going to matter what they did in their entire high school career. Um, so, so I'm just kind of lost about it. do we feel we're impacting a number of those kids that are being left out, or is it that whole body of these? I just I don't know. I, I hesitate to see a little bit. 
I can support it and there won't be a negative with it. We will play by whatever rule you want, like many other service organizations that's handing out money for kids. But I, I just think it's really up to you. If it's important enough to move it, to move it. But I think we lose sight of that importance for families, kids, of what that recognition is. And we're doing it across the board, whether it's lions clubs or whatever they're doing, granting money. It's just scholarship recognition. It, it, right, it's, 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 a, it's a philosophical thing, but to to the Simon's point, if we had waited through the spring season and finished those honors and recognitions, and and, and is that GPA, that held GPA at tipping point, you'd be surprised in those community discussions. It actually is. It's a major component, that final GPA, along with the final accolades for a spring sport athlete. If somebody is a Again, I know the NIA doesn't officially recognize all states and things of that nature, but we do look at that. Those dueling applications. And that spring sport track and field athlete who wins individually two, three, perhaps with relays, four state titles in that spring season, that if you, that's going to put, or wins a state golf championship, that's going to put that person probably over time. And if we ignore it, I don't know, so right again, if we, if we ignore spring season to make if, if we have to wait for those things, which I think are a tipping points, we just get into July. And I think it's too late. But that's my thing. Remember, if not, then we'll go to um, Colin McNaught. Uh, it's an idea that was brought to my attention that I just want to elevate that I think is something to consider too. Like when we talk about student athlete of the year, does it have to be school year? Could it be 2023? And so that would include the Spring season, and then there are the remaining two seasons. So that the student, I think, to the point of being recognized, like a graduation at the end of the year, I think that's like a really cool honor, and also something that like that student athlete could take into their senior year spring season as like the 2022 athlete of the year. I know it's a little unconventional because it's not in the school year, but just throwing that out there that that could kind of solve the, that issue. Um, and then I really like the point of it being a recognition towards the end of the kids' senior year. It's really nice. The answer already got it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll go to Tammy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, uh, Tammy, here before I wait. I definitely see everyone's points. Um, being a mother of an athlete who's a spring, whose main major sport is a spring sport, I totally see where Don is coming from. Um, but I also agree it's nice to see him at, at graduation all those things. But could you could you wait, do the whole thing, and then try to do the the banquet in July and see if they come? I mean, worst case they could say no, but they could say yes and they could all come if you did it, you know what I mean? It, it's worth a try at least to say because then you do take into account all of spring, you do take into account final GPAs, and you do the you do the banquet as well. Just enough. Like I said, it's not a financial thing. We we can try. I just don't want to be embarrassed with I, I, and I and I know we, we've asked the question a few students in the past. That's why I know this that I only a few students, right? But answers that we've received directly from students who have won have said, um, and, and because the when one Nevada was with us, they've tried to offer a, a, a specialized in the community type of scholarship handout check, the way we've done this in the last two years. And those students have said, sorry, I'm already gone. Can you just mail it directly to the university and have it put in for my, my credits? Or I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm talking circles here. I realize that we, we could try it. I don't know how it would go. It'd be very realistic. And I hate to have a banquet where we're reserving a juicy facility. We're telling people we've got a free table of come and have dinners and four or four less than half show up at a banquet. To me, that's just not doing it the right way. But I could be wrong. Jason. Jason Odegaard, community liaison. Um, I think another component, if you think about pushing this back, is getting kids to apply. If we're waiting through spring seasons and waiting for a final GPAs. I we've had several kids recognized from my school. Um, and I'm not taking credit for that because of their accomplishments, but I hound them every 
we, for several weeks prior to the deadline, we get this done. We'd really like to see you apply for this. We really have to work on this. We get to the middle of May, end of May, before they're even going to apply for the, for the scholarship. I, just, I really think that you're going to miss a lot of this. I have a question. Okay, so what what is the deadline for the? Is it April? So we are. Or we are not including springs. We are including springs. And Donna's and staff, we have not included the spring any time to this point. For all the years we've been doing this program since I started in the office, it, it, it happened. It started maybe a year before I started in the office. So for the almost two, two and a half plus decades. We have not included the deadline has always been right after the winter season. So we finished winter season end of February. Deadline has been two weeks later, mid mid March. Give us a chance to get the committee together, north and south, to select the winners. It takes about two weeks to kind of plan that. So we're making selections basically in the by by right at the very beginning of April, and then we notify the winners. We get a program created, and then we have the banquet. We've had when we had the banquet previously. Uh, we have it right before the end of the school year. So now we're talking about making that deadline not in the middle of March, but in essence, making it the first week of June. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what's on here is not the, like April. Is not That's the, okay. this, this, this is the old. This is oh, the okay. old. This is the old application, which I'm saying is the old application. Oh, yeah. Change yeah. the deadline. Sorry. That's all. Right. Okay. Um, I just want to say I am the treasurer of Twenty Pearls or found whatever foundation. Uh, and so I agree with you because I right now I have scholarship checks sent back to me that I have to reissue because kids leave, you know, yeah, July, August, all that. So I would want to see it that late. But what was your reason for saying you couldn't do it in June? It's going to take us time, number one, as a committee to pick winners, right? So this, this is spring sports season ends third weekend of May. Then we have an application deadline so they can all include their spring, spring sports successes. So the application's got, you got to give kids at least a week, and they can start getting things prepared, but probably it'll be two weeks. That takes us to the end of May, first part of June. Then we've got to get the committee together as soon as possible thereafter to select the winners. And then we've got to organize the, the notification to the banquet, uh, you know, get tables and who's invited and guests, and we've got to get a program. Well, possibly also created and written. When you write files on this kids, it takes some time. And all of a sudden, you be back at that process. First part of June, middle of June, end of June, that means the banquet's now the second week of July. That's, that's just how long it takes to get things done by them for a lot of years. It takes, it takes a lot of time. Just being realistic on time frame. Um, great answer. And as far as a banquet, I don't feel like I can appreciate it. I feel like the banquet is for the parents, for the photo op. Um, I would only consider the idea of the banquet if we have a sponsor. I don't feel like an IAA should put any budget towards a banquet. Um, I would rather see that those funds used more, um, you know, add another scholarship or, you know, for the scholarship funds. Um, I do hate leaving out those seniors, though. That might be annoying for, you know, state track. Um, I would really like to see the deadline you know, extended. I know it'd be more of a time crunch, Tommy, but if we, I would like to consider extending that deadline more to like June 1st so that they, I, I would like to see that deadline extended. Um, yeah, we just say like June 1st, they probably, they can put in whatever, you know, they want from the spring. Um, I think it includes one of those athletes, especially the ones that are not high school. So. And that, that's my intent. Notifying you that my intent is to extend deadline to you first. I'm gonna Tony and Iron as well. I'm gonna concur with the no bank. Um, it's just with the money, it's a pain in the neck. And like last when my daughter was a senior, I read through the list, she didn't get it. Not that she didn't want, but she didn't get it. But I didn't even know it was a bank and I saw it in the newspaper. So the fact is the only reason you know it's there's a bank. What is I just found out about it three minutes ago and brought it up. So I think it's not a waste of money, you know, and I agree that it might be for the parents, but I think the recognition of the kids is a bigger deal, maybe social media or the newspaper and stuff like that, than it is spending 10 grand on the night so everybody can go out dinner. All right, 
it, it, it right it's tough. I understand all sides of it. Uh, awesome. and, uh, um, this is just thinking out of the box. <laughs> uh, what if we do it from the body of work from their junior year? What what if you uh, what if you do it from a, a junior perspective, uh, um, and from the body of work um, that happened their junior year selections come in uh, in the fall, um, say by September or October, something like that, and then plan for it, and then we present it in the spring closer to graduation. Um, is that an option? Is something to think. And then, well, that, that's kind of my point in extending it all the way to June 1st, because again, doing that, you're leaving out an entire senior year. That's where the most successes happen. Again, especially with spring sport athletes. So I, first, sometimes, but in a lot of cases, uh, again, being a spring sport athlete, and those successes you can have in, again, I'm just going to use track as my example. That's what got me scholarships out from through media and things like that. My I had a, a very good high school career through my junior year, but my senior year was sensational in winning championships. That's why I racked up. Sorry, I'm not trying to make this personal, but, but it, it is. That's why I'm doing this because I know we're missing an entire season of people who have great success that they never get a chance to put on their application. I understand that because I earned my, my scholarship on uh, my senior year also because. Um, we had such good athletes ahead of us, but if uh, if the time frame is such that we can't meet it, um, and we're going to eliminate something that represents the kids, uh, I was just thinking that if we, because a lot of athletes, and um, if they're a contributor as a junior, and some of them are pretty good as juniors, and you know that they're going to be excellent their senior year. So it's all comparative because you're only looking at juniors. And once you have it on the junior basis, then it's always a junior basis. And so those juniors become seniors. I mean, I I, I can see it, but just a suggestion. So we're having so we're having a conversation now. We're not talking about eliminating the stock. Well, it's not just talking about the banquet aspect of that's so we're not talking about a limited the kids are going to get their scholarship they're going to get it I'm sorry Alice. when those kids are going to get their scholarship they're going to get it so if we're just talking about are we going to support a festivity or a banquet that honors them in in, in, in receiving those funds and if you ask the kids my guess would tell you that if i'm going to have one or the other i want to have the money Let's go to Alex. I can tell you um, from firsthand experience because we recognize kids as school, school board trustee. Sometimes we bring them to the meetings or we bring them to an event. And I've had teenagers tell me, I've had a big way to support this class at that school. <laughs> On numerous occasions. <laughs> I mean, I think it's still, Ray, I'm sorry, but um, I think it still just goes back to, I know you want to talk about the banquet, but I feel like the issue is when do we say that this scholarship is due? Do we want it to be due April 7th, where it doesn't include the end of their senior year? Do we want it to be due, you know, in the fall, also it's only their freshman, sophomore, junior year? But I feel like it should embody their entire high school career. And in here, you know, it says preference, you know, it is for those that participated in multiple sports. And so I feel like the scholarship application deadline needs to be extended to June 1st in order for those seniors um, to get the act to be able to put on the spring sport athletes. Otherwise, when you look at this, um, you know, this whole sport under their senior year, there's a whole screen that won't be able to be included. Sandra. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from the student's perspective, like I think I completely agree with her with it because like honestly for the banquet, I just like it's for my mom. Like she wants to take pictures, she wants to be <laughs> 
And like, it's just like you take off and ask along the way, you know, like, you know, it's weird. So, like, honestly, like, they probably do just care about the money and the title that I am, and that is top 10 athlete. And I think, like, the bank would have necessarily, like, rushed and told them to make it, but they, they got something. Thank you. Appreciate you speaking up. One more, and then we're going to close this. Xavier? Xavier, and the other association. So, um, I, I'm so happy I actually both came. I wanted to hear the kids. So, Sandra, thank you for stepping up and grabbing the mic. Terry, you got the next one. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I, I like what Tony said. Okay, let's do like the social media blast. Um, I still think that, you know, just getting the check mail. Man. So, if we can do something just to, to give them that extra love, get extra on, also to help them for the NIA and show love for the NIA and that there are great things, positive things going on through the NIA. But unfortunately, when we hear NIA, as we heard yesterday, you know, we've got parents saying, oh, my kid can't get clear. Oh, our review, our best clients, like we hear constant negativity. Here's a great way to positively promote what the NIA is doing, what this board of control handles. Let's, let's throw it out there. Let's do more than just social media. And, and Donnie, I, uh, sorry about this, but maybe having a members of the staff go to the kid's school and represent them, maybe at a, an assembly, uh, you know, something that, that just that does more than just, here's a check that's mailed. Now, I know that's challenging if we have a, a due date in June, but I'm also going to say that, kind of like Russ said, at, at the student awards banquet, uh, the senior night banquets, um, it's pretty cool for those kids to be recognized in front of their peers. So sometimes deadlines aren't ideal, but we gotta figure something out just to give them that love because they have spent four hard years of doing homework, of going to practices, of being involved in clubs and activities. And then it's like, oh, well, I just gotta check for a thousand. That's very cool. All right, ready to go. I mean, all of that's great, but then it still comes down to when we want the deadline. Because yes, we, of course, we wanna recognize them, but. I do feel bad about leaving out those spring athletes. So maybe I'll put both the girls on the spot as far as the application deadline for a top 10 student athlete. Should the application deadline be April 7th, where those seniors can include those spring accolades? Or do you feel like it should be extended to, you know, June 1st, where you can say, like, hey, we one, you know, state one a softball, or I won state discus. What do you girl opinions are? So I personally don't play any sports in spring, but I do think that it should be pushed. Yeah, uh, I'm a spring sport athlete, and I completely agree that we should push back the deadline. Like maybe not like super like June first, okay, yeah, like the whole season having to play off. But I feel like as your own like statistics and you know, like, track, like, you'll have enough by like May, you know. Like, so maybe like in May. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. In, in the again, this is this this is like Terry. Do you have something else to say? I'm gonna have no interruption, but. Uh, yeah, I just have one question. Um, so we're talking about. Pushing back the deadline. What is the main problem with pushing back the deadline? Like, I know we've been talking about it, but just what did you think? That, that we really, by the time you push back the deadline, by the time you get into the process, the selection process, get the committee together, and then try and write some kind of bio creation. If you have a bank, which you need to have a, a program time wise, it just all of a sudden pushes that frame back into July. And then I, many of our student athletes are not around in July and say, hey, let's go have a bank. That, that's that's what it is. To me, the, the important thing is to include the spring season that overrides having a banquet. And a few people think the banquet is just for mom's debts, right? I don't see it's really hard to live in it. Some can say, I'll take the money and thank you very much because I got the earn check because I did really well in the spring season, season. And you can't do it again until you know the spring season's done. So you can possibly win a state individual championship or a state team championship to put on that resume. And then we'll, we'll, we'll this is a discussion time, so we're going to close it up after that. Okay. So like I think what Xavier said about like the social media perspective of it, like that's a really big deal nowadays. As long as you like like that is kind of their way of bragging about someone. Like, you know, like you tag them and you post and they can post on their story. Now everyone in their entire following 
Some of the school has seen that they got the cost and actually that's the best way to know like ultimately what the budget is. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Like I said, this was just a discussion. Good discussion. All right. Let's go to item number 21 on page 205 All State Academic Team Criteria. Mr. Nelson. All right. We had an internal talk here uh, with us in the kind of leadership. Uh, President Sloan, Vice President Stallworth, Legal Counsel Anderson, and myself. Uh, based on a letter submitted to our office, you can read on page 206. We decided to make this an agenda item. Now, this is just for discussion, but this is about criteria to qualify for the all state academic team. The way we have done this for, again, doesn't mean it's right or wrong or different. I'm going to change my opinion on this here over, overnight. That um, in order to make the all state academic team as an individual per season, you need to have a non weighted. 4.0 GPA the previous semester. What this is asking for on 206 is because we do have schools and districts that have weighted GPAs, and that's been in place for a long time, that we throw out the non weighted GPA consideration. And, and anybody who has a 4.0, including weighted GPA in the previous semester, gets to be recognized on the all state academic team. Um, very interesting having discussions with, with one of my oldest daughter and some of her friends that like, well, wait a minute, we take 80 classes to get a higher GPA where we're working harder in those classes to be rewarded accordingly. Why would you say that I don't get to use that benefit? I was kind of interested, right? I've always said, oh, 4.0, non way GPA, you choose to go 80 classes, your choices. This letter kind of changed my mind in that if we do allow weighted GPAs to be considered for the all state academic team, all we're doing is recognizing more kids. That's it. This is this I don't know that it's a big deal. We do change it. What, what comes out? It's just a certificate. We send out to the schools, right? Our, we have our all state team GPA to determine that. That is a different consideration than this. Okay, I'm not saying we change the all state academic team championship award because there are schools that have way GPAs and schools that don't have way GPAs. So I don't want to create an inflated or an unequal balance for the team award, but for the individual certificate to say, you're on the all state academic team as an individual, I don't know why we wouldn't use the way GPA. What's the difference? Again, we're just recognizing more students. So is there a heartburn about that? This was an interesting letter. Okay. Well, we need more work for our office. That's I, was more clear that. I know, it means more work for our office. It's true, it, it is. So what we're going to have, our schools are going to submit for their team GPA. They're going to submit still non-weighted. We've got to keep it consistent between all the schools and all levels because some schools don't operate D classes. But there will be a second submission then that will come in. And again, this is just done by the schools. They just send it to our office, say, hey, we're verifying that this individual had a greater than four, but maybe they had a 4.86 GPA in the previous semester because AP class did it. And so we just send out more certificates. Sorry, Tia, more work coming our way. Okay. Anyway, any comments on that? Any we can move on. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Like, maybe any clarification. Um, because I feel like a weighted GPA is traditionally higher than their unweighted GPA. So if we still so basically, I feel like we're going to be honoring less. But I was thinking, like, if they have a weighted GPA that's a 4.0, or a, it would be above a 4.0, wouldn't their unweighted GPA already be a 4.0? No, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. We have those students, and this is how this letter refers to you. Know, I know, I'm trying to look at my own. Somebody's going to have a non weighted GPA of 3.9. Zero. Okay, so they got one B in, in classes from the previous semester, but one of those classes they got a B in was actually an AP class. So the weighted would have pushed them above a four point. They would have gone to a four point one five. Okay, so we said no issues. I have a backwards in my head. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Oh. <laughs> Any more questions? We're good on that one. 
Very good. We have two more to go, you guys. Item number 22 uh, starts on page 207 and NAA goals and objectives. Mr. Nelson. Thank you, President Sloan. So uh, this came from Member McNaught asked me to, to put this in here and just to get going forward to recap. And we, we typically have, have done this in the past, and so it's probably time that we come back here for it again. This is getting from my, my seat in the state office. First of all, uh, you can read on page 208, NIAA.com. I, I won't read it to you verbatim. You can see it in there, what the website that would cost us. I am, we, we do not have the funds to redo NIAA.com. I it is my sincere hope, and it has been for a few years now, that our, our marketing partner, Playfly Sports, was going to be able to fund this for us. We are going to get into revenue share. Uh, like many of you know, I've been discussing. We haven't gotten there. You've heard from Brady Raja, who's the general manager for the NIA for Play Fly Sports. That you know, he's tasked with meeting revenue share. Anyway, I just want to let everybody know. At some point, I really hope that we have a new redesign NIA.com that does all the things that we need it to do. What we have in place right now, uh, Jay and I actually designed it. Uh, geez, Jay, how many years has it been since we've had NIA.com? We designed it on the PGA Tour.com. That was a look. That was a look at that website way back. We said, "Hey, we don't have this format now. It's very archaic in the way it looks." And I, why Playfly has not helped us this, I don't understand because they can put banner ads on a new website. They can put commercial spots for the people. I, I just hope that happens. It's not in our budget to do it. I, I hope it happens sooner than later to have a new website. So that's just that's just I don't know. Um, someday. Number two, office staffing. We we actually already just discussed this, right? In terms of being able to move forward. Uh, I think many of you heard dating back about a year and a half ago, my intent, my hope was to have a, 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 a deputy director based in Southern Nevada. That was my ultimate goal. And a, a second level person to the executive director almost running parallel to the in-house. Again, we don't have the financial resources. We haven't had that to be able to do that. I thought we would have gotten there by now. We just haven't. I, I brought it up before. I've taken it off the agenda. So with office staffing, as we, we go forward and possibly look at raising membership dues, my, my commitment to you is that we need to use it for the most immediate purpose, which would be for helping with transfers and getting the timely back. So the deputy director still stays still stays on hold for a one point this out. We, we try and get uh, another one or two people that can help with compliance and transfers in our office. To me, that's, that's number one priority right now. Uh, I left some other notes in there. You can see that those don't really apply at this point. Number three, transfers. We already talked about that. We'll go past that. Uh, number four, venues. This, this is a big deal for us. As you know, we always try and provide the most spectacular venue possible, but it has to fit into the financial resources and the availability of the venue to be able to offer it to us. Right now, things have changed. We're, we're, we are, like you just words, two words earlier today, uh, yesterday, we're the on hold group. We're, we're not first priority when in arenas and venues. And that goes with the number of venues we've been looking for for state wrestling. Hey, and I we might be able to get you in here, but we can't give you that commitment until possibly just a few weeks before because we never know. We might have some concert that might help you out or some other uh, outside group that might come in and pay a whole lot more than you. And, and another group that could come in and reserve more hotel rooms than you. Remember, we used to have the Orleans Arena for state basketball. That, that was we finally moved state basketball to be in a permanent site in the north at uh, Lawler Event Center to include the Orleans Arena. That was because at the Randy Arena had opened, they were looking for tenants. We were there, we were their very first tenant, very first tenant in the Orleans Arena. That's incredible. We started basketball in there. Now we've got all the college tournaments they have in there, all that. But we're not in the Orleans Arena right now because that whole month of February, it's the first week of March for them, is all cheer 100% every weekend before they lead into the college tournaments, which start right at the beginning of March. So we don't have any ability to get there again. March is culture and start, but we don't have any ability to get in there in February because of sure. We get more hotel room nice. I've asked them again every time. We have state wrestling there. Fast oh, nope, sorry, cheers not late. Yeah, a lot of money from, from those companies. Uh, other venues also around the Las Vegas area. We have and even venues in the region. It's, it's not just a Las Vegas seven out of It's also a problem north, too. You know, we have the downtown event center in Reno, uh, the, the exhibition hall. We, we can't afford to do it. And nobody's, you know, the convention visitor stories like they're not going to spray us. They get run whole. Well, hey, Donnie, we don't get anybody in a week or two before because they do. Amazingly enough, even though you see their counters way in advance, 
There are times when they book a convention in those facilities just a couple of weeks before. So we're still the on hold. So it's been amazing. I just want to let you know we always try with menus. So you got to be patient with us and understand that we're, we're, you know, we're doing the best we can. If we have a problem with timing, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, a little flip in this comment. If we have a problem with venues, people can say, hey, we need to know exactly where you're going. You know what the answer to that is? We have to start having all of our state championships as the sites carried in the store. We're going to look at it. That's not what we want to do, right? We want to be able to, if Legion can let us in, even if they say, hey, we can, we can tell you by late September, we can get in here. So we, we take that. We don't, we don't deny it. Say, oh, sorry, we already cited. We need to know in advance which new high school site. I don't, I don't believe that's correct. So uh, the other part with venues, this gets a little bit tough, right? Keep talking about spending money. Boys and girls golf continues to be the sport of absolute highest concern for us because we are losing course availability. Everybody knows that here. I'm looking at Candy because her coach is our is our coach. I, I tell you, at some point, we're going to have in the very near future, we're going to have to look at how we restructure golf. And I'm not talking about the postseason. I'm not talking about the regular season. Postseason, we might need to look at doing things the way we used to do in the past. And that was we had a practice round on day one, whatever that is. And the course used to give us practice rounds for free. But then over time, you know, this is still years ago, they, they charged our teams a nominal fee to have a practice round there. And then we had a one-day state tournament. The reason we had one day is because the golf courses could say, you know, we can give you a day. That's okay. Then our coaches went, you know, and only to be fair to a tournament, we're having teams travel north and south. We need to have a two-day tournament. If you don't play well on day one, you know, we need a chance to make it up. And let's have day two. We approved that as a board years ago to have a two-day state tournament. When we originally approved to have a two-day state boys and golf tournament years ago, it was that you would not have a practice for well, of course, that, you know, but, well, we still need a practice round, right? So what we said we weren't going to do, we ended up doing it anyways. Now we have a practice round, day one, day two, state tournaments. I think the solution for state golf would be, number one, a one-day practice round where the golf courses can charge money to, to our teams and then have a one-day only state tournament. Another option is if we, even with that, the one-day state tournament, if we really want to have a better opportunity to find golf courses, we might have to start charging entry fees for our teams to play golf. Now, the NI doesn't charge entry fees for any particular any state tournament for any athlete qualifying, team qualifying. We've always made that inherent within our membership dues. But golf's a different piece. I don't want to lose golf. I think we're on the verge of possibly losing golf. The NNGA, the Northern Golf Association, is trying to help us. The Southern Nevada Golf Association, I know, is working with Jeremy. They're getting involved. They've helped us with the five day tournament for this year. But even for them, trying to convince golf courses within their organization to give up two times for free to us anymore. As we heard the comment, it's an $8,000 bill that they're giving up at a high school golf. I have a lot of tea time that they were day two. That's, that's not going to get any easier from here on out. So I want you to just kind of consider that. This may be something we have to bring back sooner than later. Uh, number one, one day practice round designated. Courses can charge fees. One day only state championship term. Ask the golf courses, hey, if, we, if you... Charge for practice fees where you give us one day for free. I think we might be able to do that for a little while longer. But if you really want two days, even some golf might say, even for one day, we want to charge it, just be ready for that. I think we're going to be paying for that. Okay. 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 So, Darby, when you start talking about charging kids in schools and, and that kind of stuff, is that for regional and state or is that for weekly practice rounds and all of that? Region, I'm not talking region state, I'm talking about NIA policy. So you're yeah, talking about want that, that's okay, so yeah. okay. Are other states with golf programs are they charging for regional and states? Yes, they are. Can you bring that data to us? I, I can I can certainly find it in our uh, December executive yeah. director's conference. Okay. okay, and then the other thing I wanted you to find out for us is what um what are other states and regions doing regarding Regular season golf for girls and boys as well. Okay. During the regular season, that when you get to a local level, schools typically get identified with a course. And now it's getting to be multiple schools identified with only one course, which people lost some courses too, and availability. You know, um, you, you probably all is sex I finished up with this year back. Yeah, they're, they're, they're charging our schools already for regular season. That doesn't involve the NIA. I'm, I'm only talking about the postseason. I realize. Association, I think what we can do 
in the immediate future. And I'm not, I'm not talking about girls golf this, this fall, and I'm not talking about boys golf this spring. I'm talking about next year, is that I think we need to go back to a one day only stage run. Now, this isn't for action, this is just my commentary, right? You talk about goals and objectives, and, and one of the goals and objectives is how to save golf in our state. That's all I meant. <laughs> yes, so I, Jeremy is my, my current golf coach. Um, and I think the conversations that, that he's been having, I've been having, other people have brought to me, isn't, so I guess my first question would be, if we charge for golf, who's paying? Is it the school? Is it the parents? Is it, because that's definitely an equity issue, because I can tell you right now, some schools, their parents aren't going to be able to pay. I can tell you some schools, they don't have a problem with it. They, they have one parent that will write the check. So it's, and especially in golf, that, that you see that it's more glaring probably in golf than in any other sport where you have the have and have not. So I feel like that's something we got to be real careful with if we do charge is who's paying it. Because um, I know as an AP over athletics, I'd be like, you know what, ladies is paying it because I can't ask the parents of my school to do it. Um, the second thing that I think is part of an issue that probably needs to be brought up, and this is maybe because I saw it and witnessed it for the very first time ever, um, we probably are losing things from courses because we have kids qualifying that shouldn't qualify um, because of the way our roles are written. And I don't, I don't think it's a problem at the 5A level, but I can guarantee you it's a 3A, 4A problem because we take, you know, your top three teams in regionals, and then you take the top six individuals that are not on those teams. Well, like I know for 3A last year, one and two were had legit shots at being there. Three, four, five, and six were shooting 115. Shouldn't be at a state tournament. So I and I know we want to get kids out there. I know we want to get kids to participate, but this is definitely one sport that we probably need to relook at how they qualify for state. Um, and again, like I said, I know it'll be we were three A last year, we got bumped up, but I can already tell you looking at scores, it's gonna be an issue in four A as well. Um so I think that is part of the problem. And I think it's CCSD. I know I've had this conversation with Pam before that it's part of the problem with our local mids as well, not just regionals and state. But part of the reason they're getting frustrated is they're having thinking they're giving up two hours and they're giving up five because these kids are so slow. And we have coaches that aren't pulling them off when they should. Um, but and for the two day, the two day, one day, I, I mean, I don't think anyone would love it a one day. I think that they would be open to a one day if they have the one day practice round. But again, it's going to be who pays for it. I think all of it's going to come down to who has to pay that bill. But I do think if we don't start offering some sort of money to, to golf courses, we are going to lose golf. It's going to happen. If the writing's on the wall. Yeah, this just brought to you, just brought to your attention. And this is Susan knows from again. Yeah, she wants. I know it's out of the way, but has anybody approached Coyote Springs? Yes, they 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 are really three eight had three matches there last year for boys. I don't know about girls. Um, they worked very well in local, but when it got to regional time, it's it's the timing of regionals and state more than anything. Up in the north, it's right when you guys are opening back up, and so people are dying to get on the course in here. It's coming right like girls right now, they're coming right out of what you're seeing. So people haven't been golfing for a month and they're dying to get two times. Boys, you're coming right out of the, you know, you're the perfect weather, basically, is what you're getting and you're getting all the tourists coming at the same time as state golf is. So. Yeah, I'll just add uh, calling on region four. First of all, I thank you. Uh, you know, I, I asked for like a, the, the, an overview um, of the goals and objectives of the organization. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. So thank you. A couple of specific comments and then just an overall like kind of push on this a little bit. So, first, uh, regarding the website, I, um, I'm surprised to see that number. Uh, and so, I mean, I'll just give you my school website cost me $3,000. And I think it, a couple 
publishes a lot of the same things here. I don't know exactly what you're looking for. And this is not necessarily like to explain it right now. I'm just throwing out there that we can maybe explore other avenues that are much cheaper. Um, I think the venue thing is a really important thing to bring up. I mean, that's a $90,000 budget line you could save in exploring schools, which also sends money to schools, right? Schools can do concessions when they host it, things like that. So I think like really great thought there. Um, regarding golf, I'm just wondering, maybe this is against regulation, so it's good for something, but like sponsorship of teams to help. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's money out there, like five from the private sector, that would gladly put them on the team to help pay for an event. So I don't know, just, just throwing that out there as well. Um, one of the things my push on this, so I think this is, like I said, I think this is fantastic. A little bit of what I'm looking for too, is like for you to kind of give us some measures of success. So what what are the what are the things you're looking at that you want to see improved? Recognition, public relations, student engagement, like those kinds of things. I'd love to see in, in a future meeting. I'm just like you're looking at X number of students are engaged in athletics. I'd like to see that number grow. Here's how um, the current perception of the NIAA is X. I'd like to see that change in the long way. I'd like to see more students, you know, things like that. I'd love to see this as well. Um, just so that way, you know, these are all wonderful things, but then I'd also like to be able to say like, hey, you said you wanted to grow X percent. Here's where we landed. How did that go? You know, so just kind of a push on this. But again, thank you very much for putting this together. It's great to see where your head is at on a lot of this stuff, but I think I would love to push for those kind of measures of success as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. And for this one, just number five, real quick there. In, in, in 2025, uh, our association will be hosting the Section 7 8 NFHS meeting. Uh, it involves 11 states and all other states around the country are invited to attend if they want to go west. Sections one and two be together, three separate for sailing. So every every section has some kind of a meeting with itself and other board members. So we're, the plan is to have that. In Las Vegas, uh, I think I mentioned that yesterday we had a venue secured and on hold at North Tahoe, a venue secured and on hold in South, South Lake Tahoe. I think if people want to travel to Reno and go somewhere different, you need because typically these, these are the conferences are held in different kind of places. Uh, but no, they, they, all, they all told me they went to Las Vegas. So we'll start working on a site at that point. It's September 14th to the 16th, 2025, long ways away, but you'll all be invited to attend a, you know, a Section 7 meeting. Okay, we have one more meeting. Um, one more agenda. Let's go to agenda item number 27 on page 222, Hall of Fame application. Thank you, Daniel, some of the staff. Uh, President Sloan just asked me to put this on here. So for you all to help us vet the message that we are always looking for nominees for our Hall of Fame. This year, coming up, uh, banquet will be at the basically right around the, ac the end of the academic year, though it has no ties to the academic year because these are all adults. But uh, we're, it'll be a northern rotation, just like we are at the Orleans Arena this, this past June on southern rotation. So we'll select somewhere between six and 12 nominee, you know, um, applicants to be named to our Hall of Fame. We have a, we have a banquet that goes forward. We, we do a program. It's a, it's a dinner type of function. Uh, this is just to say, hey, if you can help us out, you can Bet this out to people you know who deserve to be worthy of being in our Hall of Fame. 25 years of service required uh, for, for athletes. That's the 15 years after graduation. So there's multiple categories that you can nominate for the Hall of Fame. You can see this through here. So again, athletes, 15 years after graduation, their successes in high school or even including there and beyond into collegiate and professional ranks. Uh, coaches, at least 25 years of service and retired. Contest officials, at least 25 years of service with an association and retire. A contributor, same thing. That could be anybody who helps in a school building who's made major unique contributions to your athletic department. Retire. Uh, there's the athletes. And so that's the, that's the application package you have in there going through page 228 in there. You can take a look at it. Please use this which we're always looking for nominations for all of them. Thank you. Ms. Townsend. Ellen Townsend, officials liaison. Um, if we have already submitted a nomination or an application for a nominee those sit in your queue yes i do once they're submitted they hold into the northern queue or the southern queue depending on where they're based and then we just we, we bring them into the selection process but it's that area is in the states turn to, to go through the hall of fame program okay you don't need to resubmit 
right? So, so if that person happened to just live out of state, it's a possibility they could be in either either the north or the south recognition. Certainly, we would okay. see, yeah, that's we, we would see where their general where their contributions are one half of the state. And sometimes it goes right. Sometimes somebody lives in Reno, moves to Las Vegas, and they participated in both associations. We take all that into consideration. Say, hey, where do you want to be inducted in the south? We just had an individual who started in the south as an administrator, ended up career in the north, and wanted to be inducted in the south. That just happens on location. So anyway, if you if, if ask a question about an application you submitted previously, you want to make sure I still have it, haven't lost it, just let me know later. I'll look it up. I have a whole file of these things that, that goes from year to year. Thank you. All right, winding down. Let's go to a Agenda item number 30 on page 239. Agenda planning items for future meetings. Before I give it to you, I just make some recommendations. Uh, we didn't get a report from Brady this time around. Okay. Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks. So, so Brady Roger, as you know, hopefully you've seen it now. He's given us a monthly update. And you, you hopefully have seen that from me for it on to. That is going to serve in lieu of a of a, of a, a seasonal report because we're going to get it monthly, so it's more time. I tasked him with Brady. You got to tell us where we are, when we're going to re reach uh, revenue share. Getting anything from him monthly in a written form to me is much more important than having him give a, a quick little recap, whether it be orally or in writing, something that's not detailed on, on a seasonal basis. So. So that, that report will go away. Why it's on here still in item 30 is because in our in our January meeting, I am going to hold the task to come and actually visit with us personally and say, okay, we'll get your monthly reports, but give us a verbal two now so where we are. That's kind of the halfway point of the year. So I want to get more and more efficient up here. Okay. So a bunch of my list here. First one's just a note. Um, Lynn, Lynn is gone. She's going to be on our sportsmanship committee. Okay, a, a standing item that will appear from here on about schools dropping programs. That would become a standing item on here. The other ones you see on there are always coming towards winter, winter season, a new membership application as a winter meeting type of thing. Partnership updates I just addressed with Brady and in person, but we're keep going to a monthly report that I'll just email to you. Sports and chip committee updates. Again, that will we'll have uh, Dale Norton, our sports and chip committee person, be back in person in January to give us some updates, especially on our and uh, you know how our Official recognition week goes in the fall. We'll do that. Uh, the first equity inclusion belonging committee updates uh, with uh, Shanoa Davis, the chair of that committee. We'll get an update for that for, for the uh, January meeting. We haven't met yet again since the end of the school year, so that, that, that's why it's pushed to the winter meeting. Policies, regulations, and rules committee. Lori Lots in our office has a couple different things that she's working on with small groups, but that leads to the big one, which is about a first entry and or one time transfer rule committee that I'm going to start setting up. So we'll bring that back, obviously, the winter meeting in January. Uh, other things that I have, we're going to bring back the co-op offer just for discussion again, more defined and what that is. That's based on the discussion we had yesterday. Uh, we're going to bring back about uh, with regards to realignment and also membership purposes. We're going to be back about defining teams and minimum number of participants. We, we mentioned the individual based sports uh, a little bit yesterday, not not in official capacity about cross country being five or four. Boys and girls golf being four to score to be recognized as a team, tennis being six, bowling being four, and then some of the other sports we're going to reference to our academic requirements and a team GPA, such like as wrestling, having to have seven members. That's half of the individual weight classes. Track and field, having to have seven members. That's half of the individual events, track and field, and swimming and diving, having six, which is half the individual events in, in, in swimming and diving. So we'll bring that back. Uh, membership dues increase, we we'll bring back. After our meeting on November 2nd, superintendents, we can pick that up for action. Uh, 24 25 calendar and fixing the state football day in the South moving forward. Uh, also, the 25 26 master activities calendar committee, local ranching committee, bring that back and talking about what we do and possibly having an end date that would be very different. And I can already tell you, if you have a different end date, the opportunities that would extend to having winter season and, and encompassing extra weeks to Note the, the winter period where the schools are on break that helps that season and obviously spending the spring season with spring breaks and giving them an opportunity to shift off of being on top of winter or having a winter season on top of that. Anyway, we'll talk about that as a committee. And then uh, also the formation of the realignment committee will come up for approval on, on those individuals that will be there. Mr. Davis will report through through all of you on that. So those are the big ones that I have. Let's see about this committee. 
Is there anything that any, any individual table would like to have? I uh, do have Colin, did you have I've got Colin notes. Uh, sorry, I, your your notes from just about maybe maybe yeah, because it's both yeah. Okay. I do have one I'd like to the board with the recent incident that occurred um, at the football game. I would like to request that NAC uh, 385B.824 that we have a discussion in regards to that subsection 4 and 8 that discusses the, the venture theory and the time. Because right now, the way I said, I said before, during, after, special situation, just conversation. Yeah. That's all. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, moving on to agenda item number 31 for public comment. This time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the board about any matters not on the agenda. Items raised during the portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon until notice proceed. Procedures of the open meeting law have been com complied with. Should a member of the public wish to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda, it is asked that the said person please complete a yellow public card, comment card, and submit to the president prior to the opening of the item. Uh, a limit of three minutes per person and or five minutes for the spokesperson of the group may be opposed. It is requested that comments be directed to the board as a whole, comments that are determined to be irrelevant, repetitious, offensive, inflammatory, Locally disruptive or deemed to be personal tax will not be permitted. Tia, we have a public comment. Is that correct? We have that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Executive Director Nelson, I am writing on behalf of the Art Review Varsity football team in light of the recent altercation that took place after the Art Review versus Desert Pines game. It was a long, stressful, intense game from the beginning. There's no doubt that emotions are running high on each side with the multiple scary injuries. And as a parent, my number one concern will always be the player's safety and learning. I am used to the world of football, but I'm a mother as well and also work in education. I absolutely support the NIAA and meeting to regulate unsportsmanlike conduct and provide consequences for those who participate in altercations. I have two major concerns regarding that evening. First and foremost, I am imploring you to do more research into adult development. I am as I am sure you have seen, a news eight captain would appear to be a very to, to be an adult representing Desert Pines, who very strongly slammed an art review player to the ground hard enough to knock him out. If this was indeed an adult, then this issue needs to take a high priority and action must be taken to ensure that this adult is no longer permitted on the football field. My second concern is the equity of consequences. While I was not holding a camera, I was much too busy searching the crowd to ensure my son was far away from danger, I can attest that I watched a sea of desert pine players running to our sideline where our review players were beginning to gather their belongings long after the game had ended. It was an extremely scary situation in which I believe many of our boys ended up taking unprovoked punches, shoves, or hits. With that being said, I would never attempt to claim that all of our students were innocent or avoided necessary consequences. However, these team consequences need to be equitable. To my understanding, the RVB team is actually being penalized more harshly than Desert Pines. Since RVB would have already won the game, they are taking two forfeits, while Desert Pine, who had already taken the loss, is only forfeiting one game. In addition, the new potential standings could benefit Desert Pines' ultimate standing. My added concern here is that it can set a precedent for future teams to assure a better standing by forcing their opponents to take added losses by forfeiture. Again, I appreciate your time and due diligence to this extremely market-making situation. I encourage you to ensure you watch the video content and read all witness statements. Ultimately, I hope you are able to come to the conclusion that it is both fair and just for both teams involved while ensuring and the safety is not just of these athletes, but for future athletes as well. Thank you for your consideration. Like that, Aaron, for our review for both athletes. Um, hi, I am reaching out today as a mother. I am very excited about what happened on the game Friday evening. I am going to stand out to me and have been sticking with me. First and foremost is safety. The safety of our players, the safety of the player who broke his leg, and the safety of fans. I have a five-year-old daughter who was in tears, afraid of what would happen to her brother and his friends as she saw Desert Pines players attacking the team she loves to watch. I have appalled at the actions of the Desert Pines, Pines staff and players. We who are involved in the high school football world are well aware that Desert Pines has a reputation of fighting. I understand that sometimes players come from rough backgrounds and sometimes that includes fighting being part of a life that they 
that includes fighting being part of the life of David Uncle. However, it affected my son this past Friday and now emotionally my daughter. And I'm not okay with it. We have to do better. This is an ongoing trend with school and staff. Something must be done. How often the kids of our review are punished, yet the same thing has happened before with this team and several of the coaching staff members are still on the team. It seems to me problem lies with the coaching staff and nothing is being done. We are very lucky that no day was terribly hard during this altercation. Students are now being threatened online by players. Slash students of Desert Pine, this is not okay. In today's dangerous culture, we need to make sure that we are protecting our players and students at all costs. No football game should ever lead to death threats to players. I do not know what it's going, what it's going to take for something to be done to this team. They cannot continue to start problems with teams and not have bigger repercussions. Starting with the coaching staff. Both teams and their opponents. Both teams have their moments. Injuries, smack talk, or all doing. However, the one thing our league did not do was initiate this altercation. For heaven's sake, they were on the sidelines. Let me ask you, if you watched the different videos of the altercation, they showed desert crimes on our review sideline. We all kept asking the same question, what should these players have done? This is a team who brags and blows about their fighting abilities. This is a reputation they have set for themselves in the Las Vegas high school football world. Parents should not have to actually fear playing a team for safety reasons. Something has to be done. Something was. And I, like so many others, do not find it fair. Our review is being punished for most of this. They should have not have to give up a win for an altercation they did not start. What precedence is a set for the future? Kids are already talking about how they're going to do this to start by proficient form and to get them to have four wins and break the rating. <laughs> All teams across the valley are talking about it. You are setting an example here, and I'm afraid it is not the right one. This sets it up for future safety issues during the game, so that kids now have this idea in mind. I'm also very upset that it took a long time to get as a kind of player who broke his legs and assistance. Again, as a mother, I do not know how his family did it. This is something that can be worked on and should be. No child should ever have to endure that in a city as big as Las Vegas. I pray that child may see recovery and that his adrenaline carry with good pain. With the intense games, they are putting families at risk. I saw they will never take my daughter to another armor game where they play desert times. The risk is not worth it. Football games should. Teresa Hernandez. My grandson plays for Arbor View, and I was at the Desert Pines game last Friday and witnessed what I feel to be a very disturbing end to the game. First off, I had an unsafe feeling when I arrived in which Metro was present. I feel it is unfair to have that winning game taken away from Arbor View, especially as I clearly witnessed Desert Pines charging the field to the Arbor View side right after the game ended, which on multiple videos that were taken as well. I especially found it disturbing watching as an adult from those are kind of staff take, uh, taking down an Arbor View player and then being punched in the head by a kid from Desert Pines as that adult went on. I hope they face consequences for their actions. Arbor View won that game, and I feel those kids should not have have it taken from them because of poor sportsmanship and illegal actions from the opposing team. I ask that you please reconsider your decision. Thank you. Okay, this is from Matthew Berger. I would like the following out of the public comment agenda for this game. In October 2019, Durango and Desiree Laces had an Indian fight, which resulted in a decision by the NFL to award a double forfeit for both teams. So a similar decision is to what's being handed now to our review in Desert Heights this week. Both teams had to forfeit that game and the next game. The NIAA came back and changed the rulings to see what game forfeit for both teams and allowed them to play the following week. I am bringing this up because it shows there is precedent with the NIAA to allow changes to a ruling. Since the altercation between our review and Desert Pines this past Friday night was after the game was completed, I understand the decision to forfeit this week's game for both teams. Still, the decision to take away a win from our team when the game was already completed seems to be an area where the change to be made. Taking away the win and allowing two losses for a single game could have been now seen and tiebreakers to play. I ask that you please reconsider your decision in this matter and allow the outcome 
of the completed game to the scale. Thank you. So this is from Nicole Miller. Good evening. I'm Ryan on behalf of my son, who is a senior, and his team. I was present at the game and witnessed the event that took place upon the game ending. From what I saw on stands and behind the students and our coaches, both physical wrestlers, expecting people to stand back while their teammate is being brutally attacked is outside the realm of the group of teenagers that is out of mental capacity. Their prefrontal cortexes are still developing, and this is what can trip them to look at them to control. This is an explanation for said behavior that I do think should be taken into consideration when reviewing the pieces of the event that took place. While I understand there needs to be rules and policy to prevent and deter these types of situations from occurring, I don't think the punishment to our review does, doesn't quite match the crime. I don't necessarily believe that there should be no punishment, but I think their win that they earn should still belong to them, or they should be allowed to play their game with Bishop Corbin. To punish them, the exact same way when they were not the aggressors in the situation is not fair to our rugby football. I ask that you please reconsider your ruling about having a rugby game from 922. And it now counts as a win at the very least. Thank you for your time, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so Daniel's on the staff again. We, we don't address directly in response to public comments. Just one little note, though, we do have a deadline for public comment to be submitted. We post that within the packet. Uh, maybe, maybe learning experience for all of us here and that maybe those shouldn't have been admitted for public comment. What typically happens is when public comment comes into our office, I reply to the individual. It's not designated specifically for public comment for the board meeting, but it looks like it's something that is not on the agenda or something. I, I always reply to the person. To say, do you intend this to be for public comments? The board meeting is so I'll print it out, we'll read it, you know, what would you like? And we get, I get confirmation back in advance. Obviously, the five we just heard here, this is about a timing of the essence issue of public comment. Clearly didn't have time to respond to these five people saying, is this intended for public comment for the meeting? So we, we once we read the first one, at that point, we're going to stop it. Uh, so we let it go, what the intent was or not. But anyway, just go moving forward. So we're going to really look and evaluate what really is public comment, what is meant to be, and what is admissible to be public comment for meetings. I know the superintendents can always tell me what, what their process is. We want to live by that. So I'm not going to put Mr. Beck on it, but just, just know we got to figure out how to do better with this. That's all. All right. With that, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Great last two days, great meeting. Those the students that are here, thank you for your input. Thank yeah. you for engaging. Truly appreciate that. All right. With that said, at 109, call in. Put it in record.